Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and call this fourth meeting of the Legislative Commission to order. I want to welcome all of you joining us here on the Zoom and all those who may be watching on the internet or who may have called in on the phone. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman, Dick Assemblywoman Dickman? Here. Assemblywoman Hattigy? Here. Assemblywoman Krasner? Here. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno? Here. Assemblyman Roberts? Here. Senator Canazaro? Here. Senator Dennis? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Hardy? Here. Senator Sellemeyer? Senator Spearman? Here. Chair Yeager? Here. And Senator Sellemeyer? You have 11 members present. Thank you so much. And please mark Senator Settlemeyer present when he arrives. I expect him to join us here very shortly. Uh, that means we do have a quorum. Just a couple of housekeeping matters to go over. Uh, first, I want to again welcome all of you. It seems like it's been quite a while since we've been together in Legislative Commission. I don't know if that's the case, but it sure feels like it. So it's good to see um, all of you here on the Zoom today. Um, it is Monday, as you know, and Monday tends to throw curveballs, at least in my opinion. So I wanted to let the members on the Zoom and anyone who might be watching on the public know that we've been having some network issues today that may cause disruptions to our meeting. Uh, this is something that is out of our control, but we're doing the best we can to deal with it. When this happens, broadcast staff will alert us that the meeting is no longer live, and then we'll take a short recess while they reconnect us. This has been happening about every 30 minutes today, and it's taken about a minute or so to get us back hooked up. So I just want to let folks on the Zoom know if that happens, do not log off, stay on the Zoom, and we'll get reconnected and proceed with our meeting. And then again, if you are going to testify today, please make sure to state and spell your name for the record before you testify. If anyone would like to receive a copy of the Commission's agendas, minutes, or reports, you may be added to our mailing list by following the links on the Legislature's website or by providing your information to our staff. Contact information for staff is also listed on the Legislature's website. In addition, we accept written comments, which may be emailed or mailed before, during, or after the meeting. The information regarding where to send written comments is also on the website and listed on the agenda for this meeting. So that now takes us to agenda item two, which is public comment. If you have called in and you would like to speak during this part of the meeting, you will be notified by our broadcast and production services staff when you have been connected and it is your turn to speak. Please remember that comments will be limited to no more than two minutes per person. I will be timing and I'll let you know when your two minutes are up. You are welcome to submit any additional comments in writing and they will be added to the record for this meeting. If you prefer to wait to speak until later, there will be a second period for public comment at the end of today's meeting. I'm now gonna turn this over to our staff at Broadcast and Production Services to queue up anyone calling in to speak. And just remember, a member of the staff will inform you when it is your turn to speak. So thank you, BPS, and I'll hand it over at this point. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager. To provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 130. You are unmuted. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm the policy director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in regards to Regulation R-130-21 on the implementation of last session's AB-495 mine tax. In the exhibits, you will find a letter signed by many of our coalition partners, but I want to highlight a few top lines. While the originally proposed regulations by the Nevada Department of Taxation were reasonable, we opposed the amendments that were made by the Nevada Tax Commission. These include changing the name from the gold and silver excise tax to the Mining Education Fund and changing the timeframe for what was taxable in 2021. 
We believe that the name of the tax should remain as the gold and silver excise tax, as titled in the text of AB 495, to be in line with the naming conventions of other taxes being based on what it's being taxed, not where the revenue goes. We have the retail cannabis tax and the wholesale cannabis tax, not the cannabis education tax. In addition, we agree with the Legislative Council Bureau, who presented to the Commission on February 18th, that the tax should not begin on July 1, 2021. The taxable time frame for 2021 is clearly and plainly stated in Section 62 of AB 495 to begin January 1, 2021. AB 495 is a start to addressing the privileged position mining is held in Nevada's tax code until now. We should not allow what was voted on with bipartisan support in full view of the public to be manipulated in the regulatory process. We urge that you do not accept the amended version before you and return the draft to, the, um, to their initial form. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next caller, please. Caller, you Hello, are muted. for the record. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, hello, for the record, Alida Benson, A-L-I-D-A-B-E-N-S-O-N, political director for the Nevada Republican Party. Thank you to the members of the Legislative Commission for allowing this opportunity to speak. As you work through the agenda today and consider item six, potential adoption of administrative reg regulations, we have some relevant facts for you to consider before you vote on the block of election regulations. As you are aware, meaningful observation of the regulatory process is a foundation of our balanced government. The public craves and demands transparency, and by law, the government is required to provide it. We made comments and recommendations on behalf of all Republicans in Nevada on these regulations over the course of many hours and hearings. We have been informed that there have been changes made to the proposed regulations outside of the public hearings. If our comments and recommendations were incorporated into the regulations, we don't know because these changes were not released. The version of these election regulations you are looking at today has never been released to the public for digestion. Indeed, the public has no idea what the Legislative Commission is about to vote on because they have never been given the opportunity to review these changes as a part of the standard adoption process. As the champions of transparency that you are, we ask that you do not vote on something that the public has never seen. These regulations should be tabled until the public has been given the opportunity to review them. This concerns regulations R080 through 084, as well as R087 through, through uh, R1112. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Let's take the next caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Terry Dermick, which is K-E-R-R-Y-D-U-R-M-I-C-K, and I'm the Nevada State Director for All Bodies Local. I applaud the Secretary of State's Office and the Legislative Commission Bureau for all the work they have done on the adopted election regulations that are on the agenda today. These regulations will create clarity and guidance for our election officials and Nevada's election system, which benefits all Nevada voters. While there's still more work to do, in communities that cross this state, these election regulations need to be passed to create a fair and equitable election system. Please vote yes on the adopted block of election regulations that is on the agenda today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Next caller, please. Good Sorry, afternoon, Mr. Here. Chair and members of the... Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Legislative Commission. My name is Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, -E on behalf of the Washoe County School District. I'm here to ask for your support on Regulation R028-21. Our district has been committed to keeping students on campus for in-person learning as much as possible during this pandemic. We appreciated the emergency regulation similar to this that was available to us during the initial phases of COVID. That emergency regulation had expired during the Omicron surge and our district struggled to keep schools fully staffed for in-person instruction and desperately needed access to a wider pool of substitute teachers to avoid sending kids home for distance learning due to lack of staffing. 
We appreciate Superintendent Ebert bringing this forward and the support of the Commission on Professional Standards and the State Board of Education to fast track this policy and help school districts like ours during this state of emergency. If passed, we know this will be a help to us during this school year. I want to ensure this commission that while this increase in the pool of community members able to become licensed substitute teachers, there is still a hiring process in place internally to ensure safety and screen for competencies while providing a basic level of training to our guest teachers, as we call them. Recruitment and retention of educators will continue to be a priority for our district, and substitute teachers is one place we look towards finding future educators. Please support the swift adoption of this regulation to demonstrate your commitment to keeping schools in Washoe County open for in-person instruction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your public comment. Next caller, please. For the record, my name is Matilda Guerrero, that's M-A-T-H-I-L-D-A-G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O, and I'm calling on behalf of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. While states across the nation push back on voting rights, Nevada continue to protect the vote by passing bills that expand access to the ballot box, such as rights restoration and mule cobble ballots to be used by voters with disabilities. We support all 30 election regulations on item six because they provide blueprints for our election officials to administer the provisions passed by this body while providing transparency and clarity in our election processes to your constituents. We submitted a letter but wanted to highlight that all 30 elections regulations addresses your constituents concerns regarding election security, integrity, and the voter roll. Also, while mail ballots are still relatively new in Nevada, voters like the option that Assembly Bill 321 provides, which is evident from the 2021 Boulder City Municipal Election. Our deepest gratitude and appreciation goes to Mr. Walashian for his patience and commitment to public service. Mr. Walashian did a fantastic job at providing information and navigating folks through any gray areas during the six elections regulation workshops. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Let's take the next caller, please. Caller, you are unmuted. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Yeager, members of the Legislative Commission. For the record, my name is Leonardo Benavides. That's L-E-O-N-A-R-D-O-B-E-N-A-V-I-D-E-S, here today with the Clark County School District. I'm here to say that CCSD supports uh, Regulation R028-21, the Department of Education's proposal to give principals additional options for putting substitute teachers in classrooms. With a nationwide teacher shortage, school districts across the state and country must utilize every option to pair teachers with students to raise academic performance and satisfy the social and emotional well-being of our students. We appreciate the continued commitment by the Commission of Professional Standards, the State Board of Education, and the Department of Education to continue to tweak the, re the regulation over the next few months and look to being involved in those discussions as well. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next caller. Hi, this is Alex Watson. I'm the RNC's Election Integrity Director here in Nevada. Um, I just wanted to reiterate Alita Benson's comments from the Nevada Republican Party. The RNC submitted numerous um, amendments and recommendations on how we could fix some of these election election regulations that are on agenda item six. Um, however, we also have no idea if any of these were incorporated into the final copy as there, these were not available to the public. We recommend also that you table this vote until the public has had adequate time to review and give feedback on these regulations. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next caller, please. Thank you, Chair. To provide public comment, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair Yeager, the line is open and working. However, there are no additional public comment callers at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll go ahead and close agenda item two, public comment. And just by way of reminder, there will be a chance for public comment 
at the end of the agenda on agenda item number 12. So that'll take us now to agenda item three, which is approval of the minutes. Committee members, you'll have found in your packet the draft minutes from the December 21st, 2021 meeting. So it was a while since we've been together. Uh, these draft minutes are also available on the website. Um, if there's any discussion on the minutes, I would take that, or if anyone would like to make a motion. Mr. 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 Chair. Senator Hardy. So I, I would like to amend on page 34 under my comments on the sixth sentence up, where it says for every hundred people under or over 65 will die, there are 1400 people who are under 65 who would die. And I think that statistic is uh, challenged. And so I'd like to just strike that sentence. Thank you, Senator Hardy. We'll go ahead and strike that from the minutes. Are there any, is there any additional discussion on the minutes before we take a motion and committee members i'll tell you there's obviously a lot of folks on the zoom with us so uh be patient if you do have something if you could raise your hand on your screen I, that's probably the best way for me to see you but i don't see Move okay i see assemblywoman assemblywoman dickman has moved to approve do i have a second second chair assemblywoman second. Sandra howdy Second from Assemblywoman Howdigy. And I think, again, the best way to probably take this motion, uh, I like the way that Chair Brooks does it for IFC. Uh, we'll just oh, ask. Be, uh, Chair, ahead. I believe um, Senator Settlemeyer. Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Senator Settlemeyer, please. Mr. Chairman, can I clarify that the amendment that is properly before us is amend? That's correct. Thank you, Senator Settlemeyer. So, Assemblywoman Dickman, are you okay with a move to amend and pass, amend and approve the minutes? Yes. And Assemblywoman Howdy, will you second that motion? Yes, Chair. Fantastic. So we'll go ahead and take the vote. And I'll just have you raise your hands in front of your screens. I think that's the easiest way to see. Um, and I don't know if Senator will go ahead and do that. So all those in favor, please go ahead and raise your hand. And I think Senator Spearman is not on camera yet. Senator Spearman, did you? Uh, uh, did I, I raised my hand. I okay. raised my hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to find everybody. OK. Perfect, I see you now. So that motion carries unanimously. Um, thank you, committee. All right, bear with me here for just a second. There's a lot of paper in front of me trying to figure out where we're going. All right, agenda item number four um, is next up on the agenda. And for that, we have a presentation, I believe by former Senators Woodhouse and Parks regarding a memorial for Carol Villardo. Um, so it's nice to welcome both of you back for a legislative meeting and please proceed when you're ready and then we'll see if there are any questions. Good, af good afternoon, Chair Yeager, Vice Chair Catazzaro and uh, legislative commission members. Uh, for the record, I am David Parks, former uh, Senator from District 7. This afternoon, I'm joined by former Senator Joyce Woodhouse to present item number four, which requ uh, requests authorization to plant a tree on legislative grounds in honor of longtime former lobbyist uh, Carol Ann Bellardo. Uh, with your approval, I'd like to uh, turn the presentation over uh, to Senator Woodhouse at this time. Thank, Thank you, you so Sen much. Thank you so much, Senator Parks. It's good to have you here and good to see you, Senator Woodhouse. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Parks. Good afternoon, Chair Yeager, Vice Chair Canizaro. Whoops. Okay. Um, and commission members, I am Joyce Woodhouse, former Nevada State Senator from District 5 in Clark County. Senator Parks and I are here this afternoon to present agenda item number four regarding the planting of a tree on the legislative grounds in Carson City, Nevada, in memory and remembrance of Ms. Carol Villardo. I will be sharing a few comments as to the why and Senator Parks will follow up by sharing the how of this agenda item. On December 5th, 2021, many of us, including past and present legislators, legislative staff, legislative advocates, and the general public lost a true friend to Nevadans as we learned of the passing of Carol Villardo. Often known as the tax lady and the hat lady, Carol was the epitome of professionalism in her work with the Nevada Taxpayers Association and as the consummate citizen lobbyist, always cognizant of tax policy and the consequences of such legislation. 
So many of us have stories and reflections of our experiences and work with Ms. Villardo, and they are documented in news stories following her passing a few months ago. I'm sure that there are so many more stories to tell that haven't been printed or spoken yet, and I would like to share one of mine. As a freshman state senator in 2007, I submitted a bill draft request, which became Senate Bill 172, and it had been requested of me by a constituent. This bill was to exempt certain mobility enhancing equipment from sales and use taxes. I soon received a visit from Ms. Villardo in my office who said, and I quote, I'll never forget this, Senator, I understand what you want to do with this legislation and I appreciate it, but respectfully, I do not believe you understand the unintended consequences of this legislation. If you are interested, I would be happy to work with you on it, but at this time I have to be opposed when it comes before the Senate Taxation Committee for a hearing, end of her quote. She said this so kindly and I was so pleased. I already knew the legend of Carol Villardo and had welcomed and did welcome her assistance. We'd revised the measure and it passed out of Senate taxation with Ms. Villardo speaking under the neutral position as she shared her concerns and the fact that we had worked together to make my bill a little bit better. Of course, Senate Bill 172 failed in Senate Finance Committee. This experience cemented a strong respect for Ms. Villardo's experience and understanding of tax policy and a friendship that I will cherish forever. I welcomed all meetings and conversations with her over the years, including attending several of her Nevada tax policy seminars. And I believe many of us did that. In conclusion, I would like to share several quotes from individuals about Ms. Carol Villardo and what she meant to them and to Nevada. From Cindy Creighton of the Nevada Taxpayers Association, she was a careful, creative, and a critical thinker who read broadly and thought deeply. From the Vegas Chamber, she was a trusted voice and served the very best interests of our state. Billy Vasiliadis of r, r Partners, she was the most important person in Nevada legislature who wasn't elected ever. Saber Newby of UNLV. She was a role model for female lobbyists, intelligent, hardworking, tough, classy, no nonsense, and with a quick wit. I could share many more rem remembrances from legislators and others of Ms. Carol Villardo on the impact that she had on them personally, as well as on the state of Nevada. At this time, I would like to pass the microphone to Senator Parks to address our thoughts on how we can all show our respect and admiration of Ms. Carol Ann Villardo. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Woodhouse. Uh, as you're all well aware, a tree planted in somebody's memory uh, is uh, uh, a fitting tri uh, memorial tribute uh, that benefits both the present and the future. Uh, Senator Woodhouse and I propose the planting of a tree on the legislative grounds at no cost to either the legislature or the state. Costs for the selection and planting of the tree, as well as the purchase and placement of a memorial plaque would come from the acceptance of private donations. Since, anticipate, uh, since we anticipate monetary contributions from numerous individuals, we believe the request, requested individual contribution will be uh, modest. Senator Woodhouse and I will work with uh, LCB Director Erdos uh, and Building and Grounds uh, to select an appropriate site for the tree. Upon acquisition of the tree, we will coordinate the uh, tree's planting and placement uh, of the plaque. I'd like to close by repeating the quote from uh, Mr. B Billy Vasiliadis of r, r Partners. He said, I think Carol Villardo was the most important person uh, in the Nevada legislature who wasn't elected ever. Senator Woodhouse and I uh, would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for the privilege of your time and consideration. Thank you, Senators. Appreciate you being here and bringing this idea in front of us. Um, Senator Woodhouse, I have a pretty similar experience with 
with uh, Carol Villardo and, and you know I, I kind of view her as uh, the conscience of the legislative mm -hmm. building when it came to taxation and uh, so she's obviously going to be sorely sorely missed uh, but before we uh, consider the motion I wanted to ask any um, members of the commission are there any questions or any discussion so we'll go to Assemblywoman Dickman first. Thank you chair. I don't have a question but I just wanted to say how appropriate this is and, and how lovely that you thought of it just want to say thanks. Thank you, Assemblywoman Dickman. Do I have any further questions or discussion? Senator Settlemeyer, please. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I, I do find it a little bit ironic in those conversations I've had with Carol Vlard over the years of how much paper this building wastes, so it's appropriate we plant a tree. However, we probably should plant a tree. Thank you. And anytime you're willing to accept the motion, I think all of us would love to make it at the same time, but that's my opinion. Great, thank you, Senator. Before we get to the motion, would anyone else, uh, any questions or further discussion from anyone? I see smiling faces. That's generally a good indication here at Ledge Commission. Senator Settlemeyer, did you wanna go ahead and make a motion? Thank you. Ma and Senator, I think the, I think the uh, motion would be to, to ask um, LCB to work with our two uh, uh, former senators here to come up with a plan to make this happen. Agreed, and that would be the motion, sir. Great, Second, so I have a motion. Sir. We have a second from Assemblywoman Howdigy. Senator Dennis almost got in there for the second, but we'll give it to Assemblywoman Howdigy. Any further discussion before we take a vote on the motion? I don't see further discussion. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. I see 12 hands, 12 members. That means it's unanimous. So uh, the, the motion does carry. And I would uh, ask our director to work with Senator Woodhouse and Senator Parks to carry out the motion approved today. And again, thank you too for being here today and for bringing us this idea. Really appreciate it. And now they get to move on to the rest of their day and we still have a little bit more work to do. So that's gonna uh, close out agenda item four and that'll take us to uh, agenda item number five, which is our second court mandated status report regarding the Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles technology fee refund project. I believe we have DMV director, Julie Butler and deputy director, Tanya Laney, uh, maybe both or at least one of them are here with us virtually today and we'll have you proceed when you're ready and then we'll see if there are any questions. Good afternoon, Chair Yeager and members of the Legislative Commission. For the record, I am Tanya Laney, T-O-N-Y-A-L-A-N-E-Y, -E and I am the Deputy Director for DMV. Uh, Julie uh, was not able to attend today. Unfortunately, she is away at a conference and was not able to step away during this time period, but I'm happy to provide an update. I believe the commission received our last status report in late January or early February, and I have just a couple updates um, since that report was um, given to the commission. Since the last report, our business checks did process uh, mid last week. Um, so that is all for all the business customers, their portion of the tech fee refunds did get mailed out in check form through our uh, partner Wells Fargo. And we are still working on the individual tech fee refund process, uh, which we're hoping to have uh, ready to go uh, sometime at the beginning to mid April. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Uh, thank you so much for the update and commission members just a reminder that this, this is an informational item so it does not require any action on our part but today is your chance to ask any questions you might have regarding the project so commission members any questions out there on agenda item number five i'm not seeing anyone raising their hand so uh miss laney i think uh, we don't have any questions for you but appreciate you being here today and presenting an update and we'll look forward to having you at our next legislative commission meeting to do the same. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you so much, have a great day. Okay, so that takes us through agenda item number five and takes us to uh, the meat of our agenda, which is item number six which is review of the administrative regulations. Just as a reminder, Legislative Council Brian Fernley is with us on the Zoom today to assist us should we require his assistance. Now, before I go through the list, I wanted to just make one announcement and I'll, I'll say this, I'll try to go through this slowly because I know there are a lot of regulations um, in front of us. So commission members, members of the public, um, you should have a list. The first thing I would like to announce is one of the very, 
last, the second to last regulation that is listed on the agenda, and that is regulation R130-21. That is from the Nevada Tax Commission. Um, I will be exercising my discretion as chair to defer that regulation to a future legislative commission meeting. So that one uh, will not be considered and voted on today. And then again, we have a number of regulations under item six today, as is our usual practice. I'm gonna let you know the regulations I have been asked to hold for questions. And then after we identify those, I'll ask commission members if there are additional regulations you would like to be held for further discussion. Once we pull all of those out, we'll take a motion and approve what remains. And that'll allow some of our guests with us on the Zoom to get along with their day. And then we'll come back to the regulations that we pulled one at a time to discuss those and take a vote on them. And again, uh, commission members, I wanna thank you. A number of you reached out to let me know that there were regulations that you would like pulled. Uh, that's really helpful for me and for staff to know some of that ahead of time. I know it's not always possible, but just wanna say thank you as chair uh, for doing that work on the front end. So let me go ahead and give you a rundown of what I have been asked to pull already. And then after that, we'll see if there's anything else. And we'll stop from, or start from the top of the list of regulations. So the first one I have, uh, you'll find on, I think it's page two of the regulations, um, R176-20, the Board of Wildlife Commissioners that will be pulled for discussion. The next one is R028-21, Commission on Professional Standards in Education that will be pulled for discussion. The next one is R081-21, from the Secretary of State, we'll pull that one for discussion. Next up, R083-21, also from the Secretary of State. The next one to be pulled would be R087-21 from the Secretary of State. Next one to hold for discussion, R089-21 from the Secretary of State. Next, R096-21, Secretary of State. R097-21 from the Secretary of State. R098-21, Secretary of State. We're getting there, just a few more I have so far. R106-21, Secretary of State. And the last one I've been told ahead of time is the, I think it's the only 2021 regulation that's on our agenda. That's R066-21 from the Employment of Security Division of the Department of Employment, Training and Rehabilitation. So uh, does anyone want me to go through those again or did we, did we get them all? If anyone wants me to go through them again, just raise your hand and I can do that quickly. Okay, Assemblywoman Dickman is that. so I'm gonna go a, a little quicker this time. I'm just gonna go ahead and list the numbers of what we are holding from the top. R176-20, R028-21, R081-21, R083-21, R087-21, R089-21, R096-21, R097-21, R098-21, R106-21. And then the last one we have is R066-21. I feel like somebody should be yelling bingo at this point, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and give commission members, I know sometimes uh, there are additional regulations that you, you identify that you want pulled. So let's see, I have Assemblywoman Krasner, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Yeager. Uh, some additional uh, regulations that I had uh, a question or concern on were uh, Regulation R093-21, R102-21, R104-21, and then you already called out R081-21, I believe. So that's all. Thank you. 
Thank you, Assemblyman Krasner. I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I'm on the same page as you. I think you said that there were, let me count here, one, two, three. I think I have three additional to be pulled. Let me just make sure I have them right. So I have R093-21. And the next one you identified was R102-21. R104-21. And those are all from the Secretary of State. And what was the last one? I just wanted to confirm that we had pulled that one that you mentioned. R081-21. And I think you already listed that. Yes, that one has already been listed. Thank you. So we will add those three to our list to be pulled. Commission members, are there any other regulations you'd like to have pulled for further discussion this afternoon? Okay, I don't see any hands up as our Zoom participants. Assemblywoman Dickman, did you have additional ones? Yeah, I, I thought we were already planning to pull R09021. So can you add that one, please? So R090-21, that's the one, correct? Yeah. Okay, so we'll add that one. Thank you. Sorry there, I, I didn't see you. It's Hollywood Square version of trying to see everyone on the screen. So um, Senator Settlemeyer, did you have any additional ones? Oh, Mr. Chairman, if you want, I could try to enter, see if how well I can do with uh, hitting the correct bolt. Bingo lottery number. What, what, one second, uh, Assembly, uh, sorry, Senator Hardy has his hand up, so I wanted to see if he had additional ones. Senator Hardy, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, did we pull R130-21? Stand by. Uh, we deferred that one to a future commission agenda, so it is not going to be discussed or voted on today. Thank you. Okay, so Senator Settlemeyer, have every, every, all of our Zoom participants and guests take a deep breath to uh, hope that there is some pulse. If you wanna go ahead and make a motion on the rest, I would, I would take that now. Uh, Chairman Yeager, I would move the new pass of regulation 115.19, R2620, R140.20, R4120, R146.20, R165.20, R173.20, R174-20, R00621, R009-21, R010-21, R021-21, R036-21, R046-21, R082-21, R084-21, R085-21, R0 86 21, R0 88 21, R 91 21, R 92 21, R 94 21, R 95 21, R 99 21, R 100 21, And I think 10121, unless I got that one wrong. If I did, I apologize. No, I think that one is on the list for the motion, as far as I know. Okay. R 10220 uh, one has been pulled. So uh, that we'd skip then to approving R 10321, R 10521, R 10721, R 10821, R 10921, R 11021, R 11221. R123 21. If I well, that, was, that was a mouthful, and I think you got them all. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. It tracks with the notes that I have in front of me. Mr. Uh, Chair, I, go ahead, Senator Hardy. Did we not pull 108 21? I think Assemblywoman Krasner pulled 108 21. I did not have that on my poll list. But maybe we can ask Assemblywoman Krasner. Did I miss that? Did you want 10821 pulled? I didn't ask to have that pulled, but Assemblywoman Dickman might have. 
I'm seeing a not a, a shaking of the head no from Assemblywoman Dickman. So Senator Hardy, I don't think anyone has asked that one 10821 be pulled. Did you want it to be pulled? No way, Jose. <laughs> okay. Okay, then I think we have an accurate motion. I'd be looking for a second. Second, Chair. Second from Assemblywoman Howdy. Before we take the motion, any discussion on this motion? Mr. Chairman. Senator Settlemeyer, please. I appreciate the regulations that have been done and some of these regulations dealing with matters. I think it's important that we remember that sometimes it's better to have one set of rules for the entire state of Nevada, rather than conversely causing some of these to fail, which then would mean we'd have 17 different sets of regulations in each county. And that's partly why I'm supporting this motion on the majority of these, because I think uniformity in the electoral process is important. So we don't have one county doing it one way and another county doing it completely opposite. So in that respect, that's uh, why I put forth said motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Settlemeyer. Senator Hardy, did you have any comment? I see you have your hand up on the screen. Yes. Go uh, ahead. My compliments to the Secretary of State. Uh, we could have uh, just voted basically on the bill itself again, but defining these out by regulation allows us to look individually and as well as collectively at the things that uh, would make us uh, more secure in our elections. And I appreciate the Secretary of State for doing it the way they have done it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Further discussion before we take the motion? Okay, I don't see further discussion. I just did wanna say, you know, we take this giant motion and a lot of the folks with us on Zoom then drop off the Zoom and we don't get a chance to talk with them, but wanted to say thank you to all of those who were here today and have worked hard on the regulations that we're going to approve. Uh, we appreciate your work on it and appreciate you being here in the case that anyone had any questions. So we just wanted to take the opportunity to tell you <laughs> thank you for your work and thank you for joining us for a little bit of time here on Zoom. So we have a motion, we have a second. Would all those in favor of the motion please raise their hands to signify aye. Okay, I think we have 12 members. I see 12 hands. So the motion does carry unanimously. So that took care of a lot of the regulations that we had on our agenda. And we're gonna come back to the regulations that were pulled for discussion. What I wanted to let the members and those on Zoom know though, is we're gonna go slightly out of order. As you all know, we have a lot from the Secretary of State. So we're gonna make sure we do the other regulations that are not the Secretary of State regulations first so uh, folks can get along with their day. So what we'll do is um, we'll take the, we'll go in order the agenda with one exception. We'll take the wildlife commissioners, the professional standards in education, and then we're gonna do the uh, DETA regulation uh, before we get to the bulk of our work, which is the Secretary of State regulations. So that's how we'll do it. And with apologies to Mr. Uh, Walashin, I know you're gonna be with us for quite a long time this afternoon, but we appreciate your patience and you being here. So we are gonna go first to the consideration and discussion of regulation R176-20. That's the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. And I'm under the belief we have somebody here uh, who can talk to us about that regulation and answer any questions. So let's go ahead and get that person queued up, please. I am here, Chair Yeager, okay. thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and who had questions on this regulation? Senator Hammond, that's, that was my recollection. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm not sure who, I guess I better do the wider view and find out who said they're here. Who was it that said they're, okay. Uh, Ms. Musso, is it, is it uh, I've got to pronounce it right or else I'll get in trouble. Is it Musso? Yes, it's Kaylee Musso for the record, and I'm the management analyst in the director's office for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Uh, but we also have our deputy director on as well in case a question needs to be answered by him. And then I also have Captain Jake Kramer sitting next to me um, in case he is needed as well. Great. Thank you so much. Well, Ms. Musso, the, the question I have is it, it concerns um, in this regulation, I think it is section 6 3 4 or better yet, yeah, just on page 29. Um, it talks about the location where the mountain lion was killed. To my recollection, and as I've talked to others uh, around the state, I don't know of any other animal that uh, we harvest uh, where an animal is um, harvested and then the information given includes the actual land, the longitude and latitude of where the animal was uh, taken. 
Um, is this the only indication, is this the only place in uh, any kind of regulation where you're actually asking for that particular information exactly where the animal was harvested and, and in so doing, I mean, somebody would have to have a GPS on them. Um, and so if, if it, one, is it the only, the only place that I can find where an animal is actually, you need that information about where they were harvested and two, can you tell me a little bit about why you wanted the exact location? Thank you for the question, Senator Hammond. Um, I do believe we ask for the biolog or the location for every big game species that we have tags for. Um, it's just more specific for the mountain lion. But when you do a check-in for your other big game species or you submit a harvest questionnaire, uh, you are asked where you uh, where you took that animal as well. Um, we do have it a little bit more specific for the mountain for biological reasons, but um, you'll see that we also collect more from a mountain lion than we do for other species as well. We collected teeth for biolog the teeth for biological reasons as well as some other um, hair from the pelts as well. So when you say that you ask for location for other big game animals, is it more general? Uh, where did it, you know where did you take it? You don't ask for latitude and longitude. No, we ask for that is correct, Senator. We ask for um, the unit for other big game animals. Um, but, but mountain lion can be hunted all across the state. And so um, it's not so specific to units for mountain lions. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw that. And so I, that was the, the reason I, I asked that because I've never seen it asked about latitude and longitude. And it, it's not an easy thing. I, I know that it costs money. Now you're, you're sending folks out there in the, in the wild and they've got to have an exact location. Uh, with the instruments that are necessary. So it is actually a netted expense. And so I didn't know if you got any feedback from uh, uh, from stakeholders across the state when you proposed this. And, and if so, I didn't see any information on here uh, where you may have gotten some information back from people and, and how they felt about it. But that was the only, out of the three regulations that you guys proposed, that was the only thing that I, I, I kind of called in question when I, my, when I read it. Um, so I, 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 I'm okay with this. Um, I, I just a little, I'm taken aback, but uh, I know that Senator Settlemeyer may have another a question as well. Uh, thank you, Senator Hammond. I do uh, just want to also clarify, I guess, um, since you did have concerns, we did not get any comments on that um, at any of our committee meetings or commission meetings. This particular regulation did go through an extensive um, amount of public scoping because it went through a commission committee and then um, through multiple commission meetings. And then I also did want to add that I recently did um, witness a few mountain lion check-ins. And if the hunter did not specifically have the latitude and longitude, then our biologists worked with them on a map um, to where they could point out a location and, and they just give it their best guess at that point. But our biologists do work with them when they come bring the mountain lion um, to be checked in. And so I actually personally got to witness that a couple of times um, recently. Thank you so much. And I'll defer to Senator Sotomayor. Thank you. Please go ahead, Senator Sotomayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Ms. Musso, I appreciate your background drawing there of uh, lovely Douglas County, because that's kind of where the question comes about. Is this bill only pertaining to individuals who got a tag, or does this also deal with anyone who has a deprivation permit and also individuals who are literally just protecting their animals from mountain lions? Uh, thank you, Senator Settlemeyer, for the question. Um, I also am from Douglas County, so I do love that place. Um, and this particular section in the uh, regulation is specific to just people that draw a tag. Um, the depredation permits would be a whole different process. Okay. And so in that respect, I appreciate the language that was done here to take it from 72 hours to five days. Uh, but then it's interesting by saying unfrozen, now someone's going to potentially have a jaw popped open and an unfrozen pelt in their uh, possession for five days, which isn't a really pleasant thought to have. So I'm curious on all that in the GPS coordinates, it just seems a little bit onerous overall. And I appreciate though, this doesn't apply to deprivation permits for someone just protecting their own property. Cause as you know, in Ellis County, there are situations with mountain lions, mainly dealing with sheep that we've had to have uh, protection done. I'll just leave it at that. So I appreciate it. I am concerned about the details of the GPS. It seems like we're getting pretty owners. Thank you. 
Okay, commission members, any further questions on R176-20? Don't see further questions, would be looking for a motion to approve. So moved, Chair. We have a motion from Assemblywoman Howdy. Do I have a second? Looks like Assemblywoman Dickman has her hand up, so we'll go ahead and give her the second on that one. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the regulation, please signify aye by raising your hand. Right, I think I have 12 members, 12 hands up, so that motion carries unanimously. The regulation is approved. Uh, thank you for being here to answer questions. Certainly appreciate it. And you are now off the hook. So committee that takes us, commission that takes us to our next regulation for discussion, which is R028-21, the Commission on Professional Standards in Education. And let me see who we have here. I see the Department of Education is on video. So uh, please go ahead and just identify yourself for the record and any uh, opening remarks before we have questions, please. Sure, thank you, Chair Jeff Brisky. B-R-I-S-K-E, Director of Licensure for the Department of Education. And I'm Great. available for questions, thanks. Thank you so much. And um, Senator Hammond, did you have a question on this one as well? Or was it? Uh, yes, it, okay, I ahead. did have a question. And actually I had the department reach out to me, uh, Chair. Thank you very much uh, for this. And, and they did uh, call me this afternoon because I did have a question about this. And it's mostly because of the emails that I'm getting uh, where folks are very concerned about lowering the standard. And so for more than anything, I just want to get on the record um, as we go to vote for this. I want to make sure people understand uh, where I stand. It, it is not easy uh, in this world right now uh, to staff schools, uh, especially during the pandemic where you've had so many people, so many teachers and staff members out uh, when uh, they were taken ill. And so I want to make sure that on the record we, we clarify that this uh, particular regulation only involves uh, finding student, finding um, uh, staff members and teachers, substitute teachers, uh, to fill in uh, with um, with, the, with the standards that you have given in the regulation. Meaning they have to have a high school diploma um, and uh, a couple other things. But that only applies when there is a state of emergency. Uh, so we're not talking about putting uh, folks in. Uh, in normal circumstances, it's just when we want to make sure we can staff and put people into a school, into a classroom, and so we can try to get through uh, as, as normally as possible. Uh, is, that a, is that a fair statement to make? Jeff Brisky, for the record, yes, that is correct. And so if the, the state of emergency is lifted, um, can how long will you be able to keep that person in um, the classroom? For example, the state of emergency is lifted in uh, on March 1st, and you have somebody with that license or with that uh, substitute license in the classroom. Um, how long will they be able to stay there uh, before they are no longer you know, allowed to under the emergency regulations be in the classroom? Thank you, Jeff Brisky, for the record. The way the regulation is currently written, they would be allowed to stay in the classroom for the remainder of the school year. Okay, until that June date. So it, it's it's basically um, during a time of emergency when we're having a hard time finding anybody to be in the classroom. Uh, it's not indefinite, and that then then the regulation uh, goes away, and the staff member it also goes away at the end of the year. Um, I'm okay with that. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Thank you, Senator Hammond. Um, any other questions on this particular regulation? Senator Dennis, please. I just want to make sure um, on the uh, that we get on the record um, when it when it comes to the, the, the that it's an emergency regulation, um, and that um, this is optional for the school district. Right? This is not saying you have to do this. But they're saying in an emergency situation, if you choose to do this, you can do this. Is that correct? Jeff Risky, for the record, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Further questions on this particular regulation? I'm, I'd be willing to make a motion, uh, Mr. Chair, if uh, you are ready for that. Great. We have a motion to approve from Senator okay. Hammond, uh, second from Senator Dennis. Any discussion on the motion? 
don't see discussion. So all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, I think we have 12 members. I see 12 hands up. So the motion carries unanimously. That means R28-21 is approved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brisky, for being here and uh, have a good rest of the day. Okay, so uh, commission members, as I noted, we're gonna go slightly out of order. Uh, everything else we have left with the exception of one regulation is uh, Secretary of State, so we're gonna hold those. But at this point, we're gonna go all the way to the end of the regulations listed. And we're next gonna consider R066-21 from the Employment Security Division of the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation. Um, I believe we have representatives from Dieter here. We also have uh, Mr. Fernley, LCB's legal counsel, who's available to answer any questions. So, um, and Mr. Killian, it looks like as well, I see that he just turned his camera on. So he may be the designated person for this regulation, uh, but we'll go ahead and open it up for um, any questions uh, that folks might have. And just so you know, I, I don't know if everyone's on um, the Hollywood Squares version, but we have the Dieter conference room uh, with some folks there. And we have Mr. Killian from LCD who is here to answer questions as well. So who'd like to start with questions? Senator Suttlemeyer, please. Hey, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, in that respect, there are some questions. This is a holdover from last legislative commission meeting, and I'm still yet to get some of the answers from the last time. I do recognize that the other day I was unavailable to uh, answer a phone call from the division that was trying to get a hold of me. Unfortunately, I had already planned on another uh, thing going on that day all day. But the two questions that I have, if someone could answer, and I was told that uh, David Schmidt might actually be able to help explain it, because sometimes it's difficult to explain things to me, Mr. Yeager, as you well know. Uh, that being said, this does not create a windfall for the state of Nevada overall. And that was a question we had asked last time. And we asked them specifically, what type of more or less or revenue does this generate versus the regulation that's currently in effect? Do you have any knowledge? I'm not trying to pin down an exact number, but I just want to be able to get my arms around the idea that this is only a slight increase or a slight decrease or something of that nature. And if you could answer that, I'd be appreciative. And then I have a second question also. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, uh, Chris Sewell, Deputy Director of Dieter. I believe I just saw uh, Dave Schmidt uh, come up on the camera. So I will let him uh, answer that question. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Senator. Uh, David Schmidt, uh, Chief Economist for the Research and Analysis uh, Bureau uh, in Dieter. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, no, this does not create a windfall. Uh, this is the same average rate uh, average tax rate overall that has been in effect uh, in 2021 as well as in 2020. So it's uh, maintaining the same average rate for all employers, uh, just keeping everything flat. So then in, in essence, certain individuals due to good practices will be able to prevail on a lower rate than those individual bad actors, as I call them, individuals that had a very high unemployment rate during the pandemic, even may not have been necessarily the fault of their own, but we do know certain businesses that shut down and still kept their employees employed because they felt it was the right thing. So in essence, no new amount of money based upon the rate, the rates, what it is and what it was. Uh, in that respect though, if I'm right on that one, I'll go to the next question. What percentage of the businesses out there or a number or something will be able to avail themselves of this lower rate if we pass it today? Because I'm also told if we do not pass it, that everyone will be left at the higher rate. So I was just curious if you knew what percentage of good actors are out there, or will I consider them good actors because they have a lower rate, sorry. Uh, thank you, Senator David Schmidt again for the record. Uh, I don't have that number uh, precise off the top of my head, but I would say probably uh, more than 75% of employers uh, would have a lower rate under this regulation uh, than if the standard rate of 2.95% for all employers was used. I guess we should have passed this a month ago and I'm sorry I delayed it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And, you know, I did want to just get confirmation of that. I think Mr. Schmidt said it and, and Mr. Killian is here as well, but my understanding was uh, precisely, I think that the question that was answered, which was if we, if we don't pass this regulation, this proposed regulation in front of us today, that every employer defaults to the statutory rate uh, which will on whole be, uh, for most employers, will result in an increase in contributions. And so, so that's sort of the choice before us. Either, either we pass the regulation that has experience-based ratings, 
or we do nothing and then the statutory default rate would go into play and we wouldn't really take into account anyone's uh, in history as an employer. So if, if either Mr. Schmidt or Mr. Killian could just confirm that I have that my understanding of, of that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. Um, that, that's generally correct. There is a statutory default rate of 2.95% for unemployment insurance contributions that is set. Separately, the um, administrator of the Division of Employment, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, Employment Security Division um, annually categorizes employers based on their unemployment experience into a set of 18 different rates, ranging from 0.25% up to 5.4% based on their unemployment experience. Most employers fall at a rate below 2.95% as a result of their unemployment experience. Um, but since the administrator is required to adopt that regulation annually, if no regulation is adopted for calendar year 2022, then employer unemployment experience is not taken into account and all employers would default to the 2.95% rate. So as a result, most employers in the state would see their rate increased to the 2.95% rate because their unemployment experience would not be taken into account if this regulation is not approved. Thank you, Mr. Killian. That uh, answers my question. Anyone else? Uh, go ahead, uh, excuse me, Senator Dennis. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm clear. This is for calendar year 2022. So even though we didn't pass it last time, it still go, it's, it goes, it's retroactive from January 1st through December 31st. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. Um, that is correct. This regulation would apply for the entirety of calendar year 2022. My understanding based on representations from Dieter is that the first tax bill for calendar year 2022 has not gone out yet. Um, so nobody has paid an incorrect rate, incorrect rate yet. And this would go into effect before those bills go out. So it would apply for the entirety of the calendar year. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Assemblywoman Dickman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I still have questions about why this increased so much. So can someone explain the calculation for arriving at a, an employer's reserve ratio? Uh, yes, uh, Assemblywoman uh, David Schmidt again for the record. Uh, so the employer's reserve ratio uh, is calculated using uh, three factors. Uh, the first is the total contributions uh, that they've paid or the total taxes they've paid to the unemployment system over the lifetime of their account. Uh, the second is the total benefit charges uh, that have been applied to their account for benefits that are paid out to their uh, former workers. Uh, you, you take taxes paid minus benefits charged, uh, and then that's divided by the average uh, taxable payroll for the uh, last three calendar years uh, to sort of put all employers on an even footing uh, without regard to how large or small they are. Uh, and so that uh, percentage uh, is used to uh, compare employers and put them uh, into these different buckets. Okay, so if I could ask another question. Um, as an example, I have a constituent who since 2003 has been at the lowest rate of 0.25%. In the last 10 years, they have not had a legitimate unemployment claim. They have had fraudulent claims. And um, with this change in the rate, based on the reserve ratio, their unemployment for this year will triple to 0.85%. Now, what would cause that with no claims? Uh, David Schmidt again, for the record. Uh, I, I think ultimately uh, that would be uh, the, the impact of uh, how much uh, they've been paying in taxes. If you're at that 0.25% rate, uh, you are paying a very uh, low uh, annual rate in taxes. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know the specifics of, of this case, but my guess would be uh, that it, it's just a matter of that tax number, the, the positive that they get in the, the top of the fraction being really small because of that very low rate. Uh, and then depending on changes in their uh, taxable payroll, uh, if they've had more or fewer workers uh, over time, relative to other employers who maybe have paid even more in taxes, but might have a uh, slightly smaller relative payroll, they might have a slightly better reserve ratio. And so part of this uh, process is the uh, comparison of employers overall uh, and all of those reserve ratios, and then using that 
uh, distribution of employers uh, to assign the different tax rates. And so I, I would think that's probably not uh, necessarily this regulation itself, but rather those other factors in their reserve ratio that are having that big change, uh, just given the that they would be moving uh, a couple of buckets. Okay, and then my last question is just um, for 2021, to be paying the lowest rate, you had to have a, re a reserve ratio of 14.6%. And in for this year, and that jumps to 15.95%. And I went back seven years and looked at what where we'd have to be to be paying that lowest 0.25% rate. And this is the biggest jump that's happened in seven years. So can you just maybe explain that a little bit? Uh, David Schmidt again for the record. Uh, I, I would guess that that is in part due to the uh, non-charging of uh, benefits during the pandemic. Uh, you, you may be aware of uh, that most of the last two years of benefit charges uh, were not uh, charged to employers' accounts. Uh, in a typical year, you have in those reserve ratios lots of pluses as employers pay taxes and lots of minuses as benefits are being charged uh, because there are no minuses at all. Uh, essentially, employers are getting credit for the taxes they've paid, but nobody, nobody is being charged uh, for benefits. And I would guess uh, that the overall impact of that would be to uh, essentially shift all employers in a more positive direction, uh, but to keep the average tax rate at 1.65%, that means that the distribution of reserve ratios also has to shift as well. And so, okay. as I understand it, um, the, the employers who uh, had fraudulent claims and the ones who had to lay people off because they were forced to close their businesses, those are not included in their calculations. Will they ever be? Uh, David Schmidt, again, for the record, no. Uh, part of the, the changes that were, were put out over the last year, and I'll, I'll let uh, Troy Jordan, uh, Employment Security Division Legal Counsel, weigh in if I get this wrong, uh, but I believe that there were some statutory changes that were made to ensure that those uh, charges would never hit employers' accounts. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Chair, for letting me ask so many questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I saw our folks in uh, the Dieter conference room had unmuted. So did you want to add anything to that last uh, response? Uh, Troy Jordan, uh, Employment Security Division Legal Counsel, just for the record, I, I had unmuted to make sure in case I needed to speak, we were unmuted. But Mr. Schmidt articulated it correctly. Uh, based on SB 75, which was passed at the last general session of the legislature, uh, there are permanent fixes to that and no employers will be charged for those particular um layoffs during the pandemic so it, it is a permanent takeout so to speak thank you for adding uh, that information appreciate it okay further questions from commission members on this particular regulation assembly woman dickman did you have a question or do you want to make a motion i wanted to make the motion i thought okay. i was unmuted sorry okay no <laughs> to approve. okay about motion to approve do i have a second Assemblywoman Howdy you has her hand up, so we'll give her the second. Any discussion before we take the vote? I don't see any discussion. Let me just say thank you to the commission members for asking good questions on this and getting to the bottom of this regulation. You know, when it came out the first time last year, I think we were all a little bit confused, but I think with the answers that were given today and knowing that if we don't approve this, uh, people's rates will be indiscriminately increased. It gives me comfort uh, to approve this regulation. So with that being said, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, I have 12 members. I see 12 hands raised, I believe. So that motion carries unanimously. The uh, regulation R066-21 is approved. Um, thank you to our friends at Dieter and uh, to Mr. Killian for being here to answer those questions. Okay, Commission members, that takes us to the bulk of our work today, which is the Secretary of State regulations that have been pulled for further discussion. Uh, Mr. Uh, Walashin is here with us. I know many of you have had uh, discussions with him about these regulations. And before we get started, I uh, just did want to thank you sir for uh, your work on this i know you had a lot of workshops a lot of dialogue i uh, certainly appreciate that so i think what we'll do is just kind of take it from the top and we'll start uh, with the first one that was pulled and we'll dispense with that and then uh, we'll go on to the next one so the first one i have on my list that we pulled and please uh, someone correct me if i get this wrong but i think the first one was r081-21 
which uh, revises provisions relating to the requirements to use the system of electronic transmission. So, uh, Mr. Walashin, welcome. I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything uh, before we started questions or if you just wanted to jump into questions. So I'll give you the, uh, the discretion uh, to make any comments you might want to make before we get started. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mark Velashin, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the record. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me here today to discuss these regulations. Um, as you had mentioned, we've had an opportunity to discuss them from before. Uh, a little bit of background before we jump into them, and I will be brief, recognizing that we have the, the 12 to discuss today. Uh, we started this review uh, about 14 months ago in January of 2021. Uh, the intent was a, it had a couple of reasons behind it. First and foremost, again, pursuant to NRS uh, 233B, we're required to do a review of our regulations every 10 years. We wanted to make sure that we reviewed all of our elections regulations to see which ones needed updating. The other two reasons really were focused, one, on making sure that we, we provided increased clarity to the, the regulations relating to the requirements for the clerks, um, not only for them, but so that the public is aware of these, these various regulations and how they work, what, they, what their expectations are. And then the third part is really to, to improve public transparency as much as possible. Uh, some of the regulations, again, had provided opportunities for increasing uh, public, uh, everything from observation to um, you know, th their involvement in this important process. Uh, and, and so it was through those lenses that we, we conducted this regulatory review. And we did uh, break them down into to approximately 30, as mentioned, again, specifically to incite more discussion uh, and, and certainly got significant feedback from the public uh, relating to them. Uh, but that being said, uh, sir, I am here and available for your questions. Great, thank you again. So let's go ahead and open it up for questions on R081-21. Who would like to ask a question on this proposed regulation? Assemblywoman Krasner, please. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Uh, so I did have some questions and concerns on this. Uh, currently, a person with a disability is able to vote by absentee ballot or mail-in ballot, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So why are we adding in um, email voting? It seems like that would allow for a lot of fraud, which I know we're all concerned about. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, Mark Lawson for the record. Uh, to clarify that this bill, or that, I'm sorry, this regulation uh, is proposed specifically to address uh, and provide additional clarity uh, following the passage of Assembly Bill 121 during the, uh, the 2021 legislative session. Um, that bill that, that passed uh, put into law the ability for members of the disabled community to use uh, our EASE system uh, that is open to uh, military and overseas citizens. Uh, and this regulation simply provides additional clarity to the expectations, procedures, um, and some of the other requirements to make sure that, that that implementation is done in an orderly manner. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate that follow up chair. Uh, I yes. understand people with a disability or in the military or overseas uh, can can vote by absentee ballot by paper mail and ballot. Uh, and so I just. I'm not sure why we want to allow email voting because it just seems like it would allow for fraud. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mark Lawson for the record. And again, to clarify, the, the EASE system, uh, while it involves email, it, it is not considered email voting um, in part because of the, the required extra step that is taken. Um, the, the, the document that arrives to the clerk's offices has to be manually transcribed printed out with a typically a bipartisan group, uh, if not the clerk, uh, him or herself, actually transcribing that onto an actual ballot to ensure that the paper trail is still there. Um, it, and again, ma'am, the Assembly Bill 121 codified the, the ability um, for this, this system to be used. This merely uh, provides clarity to the process. Thank you. Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I got kicked off the Zoom there for a second. So <laughs> my apologies. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. Mr. Chair. Can you guys hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you, Chair. Okay, I'm sorry. I got kicked out of the Zoom for a second. So uh, let me just say if that happens again, um, you know, we'll go ahead and designate, um, I think Assemblywoman Merle Moreno is the, the uh, acting vice chair. So um, it's, it's after school hours, which means all the kids in my neighborhood are streaming things, which makes my internet a bit challenging <laughs> over here in the Summerlin area. So I apologize for that. I see we have hands from Senator Spearman and then Senator Hardy. So we'll go to Senator Spearman next, Senator Hardy, and then I think uh, Assemblywoman Dickman has a question as well. So go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to address the uh, question regarding um, opportunities to begin the process, the uh, voting process via email. Uh, as a former service member and someone who was stationed overseas quite frequently. And also uh, sometimes you will get orders to go one place and in the middle of movement, you can get orders to go somewhere else. And so sometimes you don't have an opportunity to double back and pick up uh, whatever the absentee ballot was or whatever it was that, that was at the other station. Uh, and so unless we take every effort, make every effort that we can, make sure that our service uh, members have an opportunity to exercise the right that they're willing to lay down their lives for, then I think that it's very disingenuous and, um, and to a great extent, it really smacks of, um, of um, I don't want to use the word abominable, but, 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 but it really means that we're not, we're not talking, we're not walking our talk. Either people are going to have an opportunity to vote which is something that people in the service fight for democracy anyway, or they're not going to be. And, and missing a document because your orders were changed in the middle of movement is something that happens quite frequently. Uh, and although we, we hope that it doesn't get to that, I think the recent conflict in Ukraine uh, probably punctuates that a great deal for the people who uh, happen to be in Europe at that time, at this time. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hardy, did you want to go next, please? Thank you. Uh, I guess one of the things that I'm impressed with is the, on page 13, I acknowledge that I, if I return my voted ball ballot by approved electronic transmission, I have waived my right to have my ballot kept secret. So that covers the secret ballot issue of the electronic. Um, I guess one of the concerns some people have mm -hmm. is if we do this, let's say this is in a nursing home and some people have concerns about harvest, uh, harvesting ballots in nursing homes, will this uh, facilitate the ability for people to go into a nursing home, for instance, and quote, help unquote, um, people who have a difficulty voting and thus be able to assist them and how they vote as in help them choose how to vote. Senator, thank you for your question. Uh, that, that is something that we are, are keenly aware of and are going to be keeping a close eye on. Um, one of the great things about our ease system is that it collects a great number of metrics uh, it, it's about six pages long uh, websites that you, you kind of navigate through as you're going through the process. Uh, we have the ability to see what page people stopped on. Uh, we have the ability to see what information they started to fill out and then stopped. Um, going forward uh, and following the, the passage of Assembly Bill 121, uh, as we anticipate an increased use of the E system, uh, a lot of the metrics that we're going to receive and review uh, do relate to the specific locations. Um, again, if there are anomalies, if there's uh, one nursing home, perhaps that, that maybe 100% uh, of the, the individuals voted, again, it doesn't necessarily point to anything nefarious. It could be that they, uh, again, are very, very active and eager to, to uh, execute their, their right. Um, but, but it is something that we're aware of and are planning on keeping a close eye on it as we, we gauge the effectiveness uh, of not only the bill, but this regulation as well. Uh, to see going into future regulatory review cycles if we need to, to modify it or somehow increase security relating to it. I appreciate that. So uh, let me ask it a different way. Do you keep track of who, if anybody, assists the uh, person voting? Yes, sir, we do. And there is a uh, required field uh, so that if an individual assists a voter, uh, again, we, we are able to capture their, their information as well. And again, we'll look closely at that too. So this may actually be a more secure system of voting in a nursing home 
uh, versus the quote unquote harvest balloting? Potentially, sir. Uh, Mark Velocity, again, for the record, uh, again, while I believe that, that all forms of voting that we have here at the state, uh, again, are, are secure, um, it, this one certainly does not lack any security measures uh, that exist in other forms as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Assemblywoman Dickman, sorry I missed you the first time around, but please go ahead. That's okay. You went away. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. So my concern with this, I know that um, electronic voting has been used for the military for some time and is probably working well, but since we passed the bill that allows this for people with dis disabilities, I'm concerned that there aren't more specific requirements to show that you have a need for this. I mean, one of the things is, is regarded as having an impairment. Um, so if I broke my finger and said I couldn't fill out my mail ballot, does that make me qualified for this? Ma'am, uh, Mark Lawson for the record. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, again, between the, the statute, the, the bill itself, uh, along with these regulations, it, it does further refine uh, what, it, what it means uh, to have a disability uh, and clarify exactly who those individuals relate to. Um, a broken finger, I, I believe, arguably would not apply, uh, given the, the, the guidance uh, in, in both the statute and the, the regulation. Um, but, but yes, ma'am, again. It just seems very unspecific to me in, in both the bill and the statute, uh, what the requirements might need to be. And so therefore, I have a little problem with it. But thank you so much for answering my question. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Dickman. Um, let's go to Senator Dennis next, please. Thank you. I, there was a few individuals in our public comment that made reference to um, the, this process um, that regulations were changed after the public was able to see them. Could you just address that and make sure that it's clear on the record on, on how that process? Yes, sir. Uh, absolutely, Senator. Uh, Mark Velocity for the record. Um, so to be clear, a, a little quick review of the timeline in regards to these uh, the regulatory workshops. Uh, first and foremost, we noticed the workshops uh, on December 22nd uh, of 2021. Uh, the, the statute requires 15 days prior to a workshop. We gave 30. Uh, the idea being that December 22nd, you know, we didn't want people to miss the, the opportunity to provide public comment um, over the holidays. Um, so we, we extended it out 30 days so that the, the workshops that came up in mid-January, um, again, were 30 days approximately out from the, the initial notice. Uh, we also split the regulations into three different groups uh, so that each day uh, we, we talk between eight and 12 regulations. Again, the idea being that I think the grand total was somewhere about 260 pages. That's uh, a lot to digest. I, I didn't want to try to force individuals to, to either hurry their comment uh, or, or be unable to provide feedback on these regulations. Um, so we had them over a, a series of three days. Uh, the notices for the adoption hearings went out on, on December 30th. Again, and that was for uh, for early February and then late February for the last adoption hearing. Following those adoption hearings, and they were conducted in accordance with open meeting law, uh, but we had extensive discussions prior to those with the Office of the Attorney General to make sure that we were in compliance. Uh, we read into the record those exact changes. When we provided the, the information over to LCB, uh, they, they did post it on a, a, the website as required. I'm, I'm not exact certain about the specific date, uh, and perhaps somebody from LCB could speak to that, uh, Senator, but it was, I believe, uh, last Wednesday or Tuesday uh, of last week when the finalized adopted text was provided for public review. Thank you. And because you brought it up, maybe we should, I don't know if we have someone from our staff that can clarify as far as that part, as far as last week's date. It looks like Mr. Killian has his camera on, so I, we'll let him answer that. And then after that, we'll go to you, Senator Sotomayor. So please go ahead, Mr. Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Council. Um, looking at the um, register on the legislative website, it looks like the adopted version of this regulation was posted on February 22nd, which would have been um, last Tuesday, which I believe aligns with what uh, Mr. Mr. Wallachian mentioned. Thank you. Uh, so I didn't hear um, in any of that, that that anything was changed from the time that it was approved and sent to us. Is that correct? 
Uh, yes, Senator uh, Mark Lawson, for the record, uh, nothing changed following the adoption hearings uh, until today. That is correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Senator Sotomayor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For clarification, I don't mean to belabor this point. I think all regulations are done this way, meaning that the department has their meetings open in the general public. They take those recommendations. They then send all those recommendations to the LCB. The LCB then puts them together and then puts them up as approved regulations for the general public to review. Am I not correct? And this is just a common process for all departments, not just the Secretary of State, but whether it's uh, the EPA, whether it's the Board of Wildlife. And, and frankly, there is some discussion that maybe in the future, we need to figure a way to get these changes out to the general public to be able to review even legislators a little sooner review, not saying that I'll do my homework any quicker, Mr. Chairman, but it's always a question. Uh, am I correct in that, Mr. Killian? Uh, Mr. Chair, Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Council, that is correct. For all regulations, the Legislative Council is required by law to post them to the register basically as soon as we receive them. So this is a common process for all regs that they get posted publicly on the LCB website. Thank you. With that, I had a question on the regulation, if allowed, Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, my question that comes is, when we're talking about the electronic system, this would expand, because currently right now, the electronic system is really limited to those individuals and spouses that are serving overseas or in very unique circumstances where these individuals have been asked to be put in harm's way to defend our freedoms. And I believe that is really the limitation within that electronic system, but this would, correct? This would expand it to basically anybody who could meet that criteria. Is that correct, Mr. Sam? Yes, Senator uh, Mark Washington, for the record. Uh, that is correct. Assembly Bill 121 did expand the, the usage of ease uh, from our service members and overseas citizens, which number approximately between 10 and 12,000 uh, to, to a, a significant number more um, when, when including members of the disabled community. And again, that there's no doctor's note or anything of that nature that indicates that they are infirmed, correct? I mean, they could just state they're infirmed. And it's basically, I go back to the concept, we used to have no default absentee balloting by our individuals that felt that they were incapable of being able to make it to the voting location. And this is basically creating a default uh, system for that as well, or, or am I incorrect? Uh, Senator, uh, they, they, they're required to sign an affidavit uh, swearing under penalty of perjury that, that this system does apply to them and they do meet the requirements. Uh, but, but there's no expectation that we are going to receive or, or act as a gatekeeper. Certainly we don't have the statutory authority to act as a gatekeeper for individuals otherwise. That is correct. I, I appreciate that. I guess I'm just concerned with how this could be mismanaged or misused, unfortunately, by some of this group of those people. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Any additional questions? Senator Hardy. I I came to this, I think it was the last meeting, and I said, why are we receiving the uh, regulation that hasn't been seen yet by the agency? Um, so I, I want to make sure that, you know, the concept usually is we get the regulation after the agency has had a public meeting, but we're, we're told that that may not be the case. And so we get the regulation first. We say that's good, goes back to the agency. They say it's okay, and then it becomes effective immediately. So there, there's two ways we get the regulation. One is after the agency, and one is before the agency. Am I not correct in that, Asher? Uh, Mr. Chair, Asher Kelly and Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. So, um, Taking a step back to give an overview of the regulatory process, um, when an agency is adopting a permanent regulation, um, the initial step is that the agency submits their proposed language to the Legislative Council. We then review and revise it as necessary um, within 30 days and send it back to the agency as a proposed version of the regulation. After the agency receives the proposed version of the regulation, the normal process is they then hold their, their workshop and public hearing, adopt the regulation, um, and then inform the Legislative Council that the regulation has been adopted and send us back the adopted version. We make any final revisions necessary um, for tech technical reasons, um, and it's then submitted to the Legislative Commission or the subcommittee to review reg. 
begs for approval. Um, there is one um, twist to that process, which is that an agency can submit a regulation to the Legislative Commission for early review, um, in which case the first steps are the same. The agency submits the initial version of the Legislative Council, we revise and send it back as a proposed version. Um, but instead of the agency adopting first and it then coming to the Legislative Commission for approval, the Legislative Commission version of it first and and if Slate of Commission approved the agency, then adopts it in identical form, it becomes effective immediately adoption. Um, that's unusual. Things usually happen through the standard process, but those are the, the two ways that a, regulate, a permanent regulation can get adopted and come before the Legislative Commission. I, I think that's why some people are nervous. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Uh, Mr. Balashan, I have a, a question, and I think you've touched on it a little bit. You, you mentioned that this regulation comes out of Assembly Bill 121, and I had a chance to go back and look at that Assembly Bill, and that Assembly Bill does indeed tell the Secretary of State that a person with a disability shall be authorized to use this uh, electronic transmission system that was established pursuant to NRS 293D-200. And, you know, I'll just, this is my gloss, I'll note for the record that this was a bill that was supported in a bipartisan fashion, including 21 nothing in the Senate side. So I just wanted to get confirmation, like this wasn't the Secretary of State saying, we think folks with disabilities should be able to use the system. This was the duly elected legislature approving in a bipartisan fashion that persons with disabilities should be able to use the already existing electronic system that is used by members of the military who are serving overseas. Yes, Chair, uh, Mark Vlashen for the record, uh, th that is correct. Thank you. Do we have further questions from commission members on this regulation? Move to Don't. Approve. Okay, we have a motion from Senator Hardy to approve. Uh, Assemblywoman Howdy has her hand up. I'll give her the second. Assemblywoman Ron Reno was close to the second there. But uh, before we take the vote, any discussion on the motion? Uh, Assemblyman Roberts, please go ahead. It, thank you, Chair. I, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you for the clarification on how this came forward. And I just want to say, look, I, I remember, I, look, I supported this Assembly uh, Bill 121 during the session. And I can remember uh, growing up, my mother was legally blind. And we had to have somebody take us to a polling place. And I would go into the booth with her and help her vote. And so I, I think this is a system that we've been using in the military. It's been rather safe. Uh, there's no uh, concern for me that it won't be safe uh, using by disabled folks. So I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Roberts. I think I saw Assemblywoman Dickman with a hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say um, I, I understand why we're doing this reg. I, I just wish there was more protections in it and more requirements to show that one is disabled. And so that's the reason I will be a no. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see further discussion, so we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor of approving, please raise your hand. Okay, and then let's go ahead and all of those opposed, please go ahead and raise your hands. So I have, just for the records clear, Assemblywoman Dickman, Senator Settlemeyer, Assemblywoman Krasner. I think that's everybody. So the motion does carry by a count of nine to three. If my math is correct, I think it is. So uh, the regulation is approved. That was R081-21. Moving right along, we'll take uh, the next one that we hold, and that's R083-21. This regulation revises provisions relating to the withdrawal of a notice of intent. And we've had some introductory comments already, so I'll go ahead and go to questions. Who would like to ask a question? Senator Suttlemeyer, please. Hey, Mr. Chairman, specifically on R83-21, I very approving of the change that was done to require that two individuals, you know, because currently right now, you know, three people put forth the name on a recall petition. And now instead of just letting one person, you know, pull it back, it's going to require two. So I'm very approving of that regular of that part of it. However, I think it needs a little bit more detail because as I'm reading it currently, there's no time frames on this. There's no dates of withdrawals. There's no issues or discussion on that. And to me, once someone goes through the process, of recalling, of trying to recall someone, then once those signatures are submitted, I don't believe that a person should have the ability to withdraw it anymore. I think it kind of becomes the, 
ownership of the government entity that is conducting said recall, whether that's a county, you know, one county or if it's multi, you know, an assembly person, multi-county. And I'm kind of bothered by that unless somebody can point to me somewhere that there's an NAC or something on point that, you know, you, you can't be the day of the, uh, you know, before we announce the results, the day before the election, and all of a sudden you just go get two of these three people to agree that, oh, you know what, uh, I've changed my mind for whatever reason, and this election that everybody's going to take and think is going to be in effect won't actually be in effect because, you know what, I got these two to pull it back. And so I'm just trying to get clarification on that. And if there is no clarification, it's my opinion, this ought to be sent back in order to add that clarification of actual some type of a time frame. Uh, anyways, Mr. Wilson, I was just curious on that. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velashin, for the record. Um, you are right that there is no timeline defined in NRS 306 or in the regulations in NAC 306 uh, that, that specifically explains the, the timing process for withdrawals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the only question I had. And I appreciate the answer. I just see that as a an oversight that should be corrected before a regulation of this matter is approved because that to me is a big issue. It could be the day of an election and people think they're going out to get rid of or to retain so-and-so. And I all of a sudden they get to the ballot and saying, oh, well, you know, actually it didn't count because these two individuals overtook the vote of the rest of the constituents. And that, that, that just bothers me. So I can't support this regulation, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Please go ahead. Uh, and maybe Asher can answer this or Mr. Velasco. What is the situation now? Can two people, can one, can one person stop the recall? What is the situation now that we're trying to uh, solve in this regulation? Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velasco, for the record. Uh, currently, again, there, there's no guidance. Uh, outside of what this regulation proposes. So it, it could be possible that one individual out of three uh, submits a request for a withdrawal and, uh, and withdraws and, and essentially ends a recall petition. Uh, this, this clarifies so that again, if three individuals are on the notice of intent, uh, it would require at least two of them to, to uh, withdraw that uh, petition for recall. Right now, one person could stop the recall. Conceivably, and yes, sir. And so this would allow for a little bit more as two. Now, as far as timeline, um, let me ask it this way. The recall usually takes a vote, vote of the people. And so in essence, there is a virtual, um, it, would that be the virtual primary, the day of the vote? Would it be the virtual general, the day of the vote? What is the virtual deadline now that isn't uh, enumerated in the statute? Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Mark Velashin for the record. Uh, again, there are timelines relating to how long an individual has to, to gather signatures, uh, but, but ultimately, and also when the petition can be filed in the first place. Uh, but ultimately, again, it's not laid out specifically in regards to the withdrawal timeline. So the, the petition process for a recall overall is defined, but just the, there's no wording uh, regards uh, specifically regarding the withdrawal process. So right now, the way it is, a single person can stop a recall, no matter how many signatures are on the uh, petition the day before the uh, election. So right now, sir, uh, again, Mark Velasco for the record, as soon as the signatures are submitted for review, uh, that that eliminates the, that really starts the ball rolling, so to speak, uh, for the rest of that recall procedure. Um, but again, it's not defined, you know, where, you know, in, in necessarily at what point uh, outside of that, uh, you know, someone could withdraw it otherwise, if, if that makes sense. So I guess, uh, to Senator Settlemeyer's point, two people now, instead of one person, could stop a recall at any point without having in, all of those people who have signatures having a say in it. Right up into the election. 
let me ask a question because I I'm not understanding this the same way that that I think Senator Hardy and Settlemeyer are. The way that I read this proposed regulation is that we are talking about um, before the petition is submitted for verifying of the signatures. So we're not talking about an election. We're at the point where, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Velash, and I think we're at the point where a petition has been distributed for signatures. And those signatures have not yet been verified. So we're not at the election stage yet. That's when somebody can come. And if you look at section one, subsection one of the regulation, it says a petition to recall may be withdrawn if and these two things are and. So first of all, you need two voter, two sig signatures. And then the second part of that is it has to be submitted uh, before the petition, uh, before the signature verification happens. So I don't read this as saying we're going to be on the even of an election and it's going to be withdrawn because at that point, signature verification has already already happened. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Vlash, am I reading that correctly? This is about the actual verification of the petition itself before we get to an election. Yes, Jared, I apologize for not being more clear. Uh, Mark Vlash, for the record, uh, Article 2, Section 9 of the Constitution, uh, our state constitution defines the recall process uh, with, with NRS 306 providing a little more clarity, and you're right, it's before the signature verification process. So this is still, uh, again, prior to that, that important step. Mr. Chairman, if I could add something to that. Please go ahead, Senator. I greatly appreciate that clarification because I was reading it incorrectly because it was sounding to me that someone had the ability on the eve of the election to change that. So as long as we agree that any time that signatures are submitted to the Secretary of State or a county official, because again, if it is a recall of a local sheriff, which has happened in a few of my counties more than once. Um, matter of fact, one sheriff had to run every two years. Uh, that being said, if, as long as it is once the signatures are submitted, that it's on autopilot, that then it's in the hands of the body to follow the process, then I'm far more comfortable with that because that's the way it should be. Once signatures are submitted and accepted by the citizens of the state of Nevada, it should be on autopilot and not be capable of being withdrawn. Is that correct? That's the way I read it. I would think the only way you could withdraw at that point would be through litigation. But in terms of this regulation, if the if this petition has already been submitted with the signatures, it's too late at that point to withdraw, no matter how many people come forward and say, um, you know, I don't want to be on this anymore. Of course, there's a signature verification process, which is going to have its own outcome. But that's a whole a whole different beast that we probably ought not to get into for this regulation. There's future ones we could talk about. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, Mark, for that clarification. With that, I, I could actually support said regulation then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. And just want to remind uh, commission members, uh, last names only, please. I know we know each other uh, here very well, but if we could remember to use last names in legislative hearings, would appreciate that. Um, Senator Sotomayor, I'll see if uh, there's any other questions before uh, I have you make a motion. Any other questions on this regulation? Okay, I think we had some good discussion. Senator Sotomayor, please. I appreciate that. And I will try to make sure to pronounce Mr. Walshon's name correctly every single time. That's why I call them the shorter name because well, <laughs> occasionally I mess up and I apologize. With it, I would move to do pass uh, okay. the regulation pertaining to R8321. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion from Senator Sotomayor. I heard a second from Assemblywoman Dickman. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. I see 12 for 12, I believe. So uh, that uh, regulation R83-21 is approved unanimously. That'll take us to the next one on the agenda, which is R087-21. This is regulation revising provisions relating to legal holidays. Who would like to ask Chairman, the question? I was the one who would ask the, which one to be pulled. In that respect, I just want to make sure we get it on the record that this only pertains to legal holidays that are paid time off. I'd hate to see a situation where someone creates some nefarious days just to extend out the procedure. So I just want to make sure it's on the record that this is only for legal holidays, you know, paid days off that have been recognized by the legislature and or the federal government. That's my point of clarification. Thank you for the question, Sen uh, Senator uh, Mark Velashin, for the record. Uh, that is correct. Uh, NRS 236.015 defines those legal holidays. Um, so it's only those legal holidays relating or specifically defined in that NRS uh, that this applies to. Thank you. With that clarification, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm ready when everybody else is done asking questions. Okay. Let's any other questions on this one from commission members? Doesn't look like it. Senator Settlemeyer. Move to pass R8721. 
Okay, we have a motion from Senator Settlemeyer. I saw Senator Hardy with a hand up, so we'll go ahead and give him the second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, I see 12 out of 12. So um, R087-21 is approved unanimously by the commission. That'll take us to our next item, which is R089-21. This is a regulation repealing various provisions. Um, Senator Settlemeyer, did you have a question on this one? Or would you like yes, to- Mr. Chairman, please, please, go simply, ahead. I just, you know, I'm not a real big fan, as you probably know, of this concept of mailing everybody about, and I'd actually prefer to leave this language in place so that hopefully someday we can go back to the absentee ballot discussion. Because frankly, I think that the concept of making sure that people request an absentee ballot and sending it in is the right way to do it versus what we're going to. So for that reason alone, I'm opposing it. I know that's not the best reason in the world to oppose something, but that's where I'm at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, I didn't necessarily hear a question there, but I think we got a statement of where you're gonna be on the vote. Um, are there other, any other members that have questions for Mr. Velashin on this regulation? Okay, I don't see any hands up for questions. So at this point, I would be looking for a motion to approve. So moved, Chair. Okay, we have a motion from Assemblywoman Howdy, and I also saw Senator Spearman with a hand up. So go ahead and give her a second on the motion to approve. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, it doesn't look like there's any further discussion. So um, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand in front of your screen. Okay, and then anyone opposed, please raise your hand as well. So just so the record is clear, it looks like we have opposition from Senator Settlemeyer, Senator Hardy, Assemblywoman Dickman, Assemblyman Roberts, Assemblywoman Krasner, and Senator Hammond. So that results in a 6-6 vote, and that means the regulation uh, is not approved. So that motion uh, fails. R089-21 is not approved by the commission. That'll take us to the next uh, item on the agenda, R090-21, again, a regulation from the Secretary of State revising provisions relating to mail ballots. And I was it Assemblywoman Dickman who had a question on this one? Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering why there are no provisions in this for um, observation of duplication of ballots. Um, because at that point, isn't the um, the, ver the the thing that would um, you know the envelope that would would you'd know who this vote belonged to? It's separated from the ballot, right? Um, and then also, why is there no provision for observing verification of signatures? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the, the uh, question, Assemblywoman. Uh, so two questions. The first one regards to no provisions relating to the observation of duplication. And then the second part, uh, no provisions for the observation of signature verification. Uh, again, to, to clarify, ma'am, um, you know, this regulation, as part of our holistic review, was, again, a, a measured step forward. Uh, there's a great number of things that, that, frankly, the clerks, the Secretary of State, uh, and, and the public all kind of want at the same time. I increased transparency is certainly one of those that's very near and dear to everyone's hearts. Um, while there's no specific provision, provision calling out the requirement for observation of duplication, uh, that, that doesn't mean that it can't be done. Uh, this is something that as we looked at this uh, proposed regulation, as we discussed it with the, uh, the clerks and the, their staffs, uh, again, we're, we're taking a measured step forward um, with the idea being that, that there was a number of changes to how our elections are run uh, that came out of the 2021 legislative session. Uh, we didn't want to overburden the clerks and their staffs by, by mandating certain things that, that may overwhelm or, uh, frankly, swamp the clerks and, and registrars and their staffs. Um, so this, this is a measured step forward. Um, again, the clerks want transparency. They want observation to occur. Uh, following a review of the 2022 election cycle, we're going to conduct another regulatory review uh, of all of our regulations to see if even these that were passed potentially uh, today, 
uh, to see if there's ways that we can improve upon them and continue to increase transparency for the public going forward. Uh, but to, to mandate and require observation of specific things, including duplication of ballots and signature verification without having the opportunity to really assess uh, you know, where we're at uh, as election officials across the state, uh, it, it just didn't seem prudent. Um, so this is, again, a measured first step with, with an eye, uh, understanding that going forward, we are going to continue to endeavor in, for increased uh, transparency in these regulations. It just seems to me that, you know, that if the clerk makes the determination of whether or not there's ambiguity in this ballot can be um, duplicated, someone should be able to observe that, a bipartisan team. So, therefore, I will have to be opposed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Senator Sotomayor, please. Could I get clarification? I thought we were listening to regulation number 9321, which was requested by Ms. Krasner to hold. And I don't see anywhere within 9321 the duplication. I thought, I thought that we were on 90. Yeah, uh, Senator, this is. Uh... I think you skipped ahead one. We're on R090-21. So 93 is coming next. OK. Thank you. Sorry about that. I apologize. No, it's OK. We have we have a lot going on today, so no worries at all. Um, any other questions from commission members on this particular regulation? Senator Hardy, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so how how is the ballot reviewed uh, by people who say there's a problem with it. So how is it reviewed? Is it reviewed by two people or is it reviewed by a machine? How is it reviewed? Thank you for the question, Senator. Mark Velocian for the record. Uh, so when it comes to the, the ballot duplication process, uh, it, it is a bipartisan team that, that is the goal. Uh, uh, in some cases though, the, the clerks and registrars may do it themselves. Uh, given the staff workloads and, and timing, uh, but but that is something that, that yes uh, is of the mo utmost importance that we have a, a ideally a bipartisan team. Uh, some of the proposed feedback in regards to this reg called for a, a mandated tripartisan team um, with a, a possibility of an adding uh, a, possibly a Democrat or Republican, maybe an independent or a minor party as well. Um, but but as it currently exists, uh, again bipartisan as practical. Um, it, it is what's required. So there's actually no way to protect the sacred nature of a secret ballot. So Senator uh, Mark Lawson, for the record, it, it is secret, uh, specifically in that the by the point it goes to ballot duplication, the envelope has been separated uh, from the ballot itself. Um, and, and those individuals that are duplicating the ballot do not see the name on the envelope. Um, so they, they see a ballot. Um, the duplication boards oftentimes address ballots that have food on them or maybe uh, have been torn somehow or coffee stains. Um, so they, again, it's, it's simply to transcribe from one damaged ballot onto a, another ballot um, to make sure that it can, it can be tabulated appropriately. Uh, but, but those individuals do not see who, who sent that ballot or, or provided that ballot to the registrar or clerk. Appreciate it. When you're ready for a motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Let me see if anyone else has a question on this one first before we take a motion. Any commission members? I don't see any hands up. So Senator Hardy, I think it's time for a motion. So moved. Do we have a second? A second, it's only one Howdy has her hand up. So we'll give her the second. Any discussion on the motion? I don't see any discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And anyone opposed, please raise your hand. So we have opposition from Assemblywoman Dickman, Assemblywoman Krasner, Senator Hammond, Senator Settlemeyer. I think that's I think that's everybody. So that motion carries. I don't know if my math is good. It was either nine to three or eight to four. I can't remember. One of those two. It carries regardless. Okay, so that will take us uh, to the next one and. This is the one Senator Sotomayor referenced in his uh, last comment. So this is R093-21, Secretary of State Regulation Establishing Provisions Relating to Ballot Boxes and Electioneering. Who would like to go first to ask a question on this one? Uh, Assemblywoman Krasner, please. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Uh, on this uh, particular regulation, 
had some current uh, concerns with section eight sub two and section 17 sub two. Uh, first of all, I, I have heard from hundreds of people. They have a large concern regarding the term persons. They do not to like that term persons in there. They want it to say citizens. Uh, they believe, and as do I, that only citizens have the right to vote. Uh, and so I, I don't like the fact that it says persons. Uh, second of all, in section eight sub two and section 17 sub two, it says um, the retrieval team. This is the re retrieval team picking up uh, the ballot box. Uh, that it should be composed, if practicable, uh, by two members of the election board who are different political parties. It should be mandatory. It should be mandatory that they are of two different political parties um, because of election integrity issues. So I, I have some concerns with that. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Assemblywoman Mark Veloshin, for the record. Um, first, to address the, the comments regarding persons versus citizens, uh, that was a, a comment we received uh, frequently as well throughout the workshops and adoption hearings. Um, upon further discussion, we realized that, for example, NAC 293 has 190 instances of the word person, uh, but, but not all of those, uh, frankly, are required to be citizens. In some cases, for example, observation. Uh, there's no requirement to be a, a citizen or even uh, a resident of the state. In fact, we have international observers, uh, you know, other folks who maybe aren't qualified to, or eligible to vote, high school students uh, and, and the like who are interested in observing our process. Instead of going through these specific proposed regulations um, in finding and replacing or at least proposing the word persons with citizens, uh, we've decided to consider that going forward for our future regulatory reviews so that we can do it holistically. We can look at all of the regulations relating to Title 24, uh, identify again, really, if it's practical to, to put a citizen in certain cases or person in others, uh, or, or to see if there's another means by which we can define that elsewhere. Um, so that way, again, it's uniform and across the board for all regulations and not just the, these specific proposed regulations that uh, frankly, only touch on, on portions of the entirety of, of our um, regulations relating to Title 24. And, and then in regards to the ballot collection teams, uh, the, the comment, if practicable, simply identifies and addresses the fact that, that we have counties where uh, the, the large majorities of, of only one party. Um, and while the clerks and registrars collectively uh, are very eager to involve everyone in the process to the fullest extent possible and recognize the importance of, of bipartisanship and that the, the election integrity of, of having bipartisan or even tripartisan teams involved in these processes, um, I guess the, the alternative, if we mandated bipartisanship, but, but we're unable to find people of multiple parties uh, would it just not happen? Uh, and, and that's something that we are going to, to critically analyze going into this 22 election cycle uh, to, to try to identify you know, how can we continue to improve upon this. Um, so I, I understand your concerns. I, I do appreciate them. And, and I do recognize that there were a great number of people that provided that, that same feedback to us as well. Um, but, but again, in, in an effort to, to not hamstring uh, our clerks and registrars in the execution of their duties, uh, that, that's something we're, we're going to take into consideration and analyze going into this uh, election cycle. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go next to Senator Sotomayor and then Senator Hardy. Senator Sotomayor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was curious, uh, if we don't pass this regulation today, there's really not enough time to get it back for changes and stuff before the primary. So in that respect, if we do not pass this not in a situation then where all 17 counties can have their own set of rules, and that means there is no one that's required to actually go out with a ballot or treatable person. And so, I don't know, I'm kind of leaning towards the idea of at least having two people of different, you know, political parties is better than having no one and just having absolutely no observation. So am I correct in saying that, Ms. Wilson, or am I incorrect in saying that? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Mark Washington for the record. Uh, without this regulation being passed, uh, there would be, the possibility uh, of less consistency. 
um, that we have some ideas on how we could try to help facilitate that and recognizing the importance of, of equal protection under the law uh, when it comes to our voting rights. Um, but, but yes, sir, uh, it, it, less guidance uh, I've found doesn't seem to support um, more effective uh, election processes, if that makes sense. We're uniform. Thank you. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I am just going to clarify when you say person, you actually mean natural person in the verbiage of the law as opposed to a person who is a company or a uh, entity that's a business. So when we use person in the law, we talk about a organization or an entity that is more than just one single person. So when we say a person, I think you mean a natural person as opposed to a person that includes a, a construction company or some other entity. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. Uh, Mark Lush, the director, that is correct. In, in which case, then I'm comfortable with using the word person as long as we know what it means. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Further questions on this regulation? Right, I don't see any hands up. I'd be looking for a motion to approve. Assemblywoman Howdy gave me a first. I'll give Assemblywoman Earl Moreno the second because I don't think we've given you a second yet today. Any discussion on the motion? Oh, hold on, I got to go back to my view. Okay, I don't see discussion on the motion. So, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And any opposed, please raise your hand. And it looks like we have Assemblywoman Krasner. I don't think anyone else is opposed. So the motion carries by a count of 11 to one. All right, moving right along. Take a deep breath, folks. I think we're about halfway through all of these. Uh, we're gonna go next to R096-21, Secretary of State Regulation, establishing provisions relating to boards. And I think Assemblywoman Dickman, did you have a question on this one or was it somebody else? Uh, well, I think my only comment was that there's no provision for observation over ballot duplication again. You know, it's the, again, we're at the if practicable term. And that just leaves so much to interpretation and I just wondered why we don't get more specific on some of this. Thank you for the question Assemblywoman. Uh, Mark Velocity for the record. Um, just to clarify again, uh, there, there is certainly a, a desire uh, and a plan to continue increasing the detail and scope uh, of these regulations uh, but, but really the, the bottom line is that uh, recognizing the, the, the changes in the laws and, and the responsibilities uh, that the clerks and registrars and their staffs have uh, going into this election cycle, uh, it, it was determined to be to make a, a prudent uh, and a measured first step um, with the expectation that in future regulatory review cycles, uh, we would um, again re-examine what we could improve upon. And, and I do want to state for the record as well, to be clear, uh, I, I don't mean regulatory reviews as, as required by law under uh, NRS 233B uh, with, with the with the states it's got to be once every 10 years. I, I don't mean in you know, 2032 we'll have for future discussions. I, again, we, we recognize that these regulations need to be updated and reviewed um, for, for again, ways we can improve them, way, you know, to, to identify uh, what we're getting right, what, what possibly needs to be clarified. Um, and, and so therefore it's going to be a biennial review uh, that, that we're planning going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Veloshin. Did I say it right? I think so. It sounded right to me. Yes, ma'am. Veloshin. It, it does help to not look at it when you say it for, for what it's worth. We'll, uh, we'll give Senator Sotomayor a few more times to try it out throughout the meeting and see how he does. Uh, any further questions on this particular regulation? I don't see any hands up. I make a motion to approve. Assemblywoman Howdy with a motion. We'll give Senator Dennis the second on that one. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. 
And then anyone opposed, please raise your hand. And just so the record is clear, we have no votes from Assemblywoman Krasner and Assemblywoman Dickman. I think that's it. So the motion carries 10 to 2. Our 096-21 is approved. It takes us to the next one we're going to consider, and that's R097-21, Secretary of State Regulation, revising various provisions. Senator Settlemeyer, I think you had a question on this one, but correct me if I'm wrong. Senator Settlemeyer, I believe you're on mute. I believe it was Assemblywoman Dickman who had some concerns. I had some issues with the deletion of the felon voting rights, uh, but it's interesting that actually very few people were objecting to uh, taking that out of rules, but I believe Ms. Dickman had some questions. Great, thank you, Senator Sotomayor. Uh, Assemblywoman Dickman will go to you then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my, my only issue on this one is um, all these things that, 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 that they need to do, that the poll workers need to do at the end of the day, um, that they have to report to the Secretary of State, but I don't see anywhere where it, it uh, has to be released to the public. Um, is there a provision for access for the public to this information? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Mark Velashin, for the record. Uh, so again, this is that's one of the other things, quite frankly, that we've been talking about and are really interested in trying to increase, uh, specifically relating to, to public transparency. Um, but again, to have it as a measured step, that it, there's frankly two of our counties that, that would likely be able to meet that sort of requirement, a mandated every day that something is provided, uh, it would be published to the, the public. Um, but again, you know, we, we want to see if it's possible going forward so that all 17 counties can uniformly, you know, compile information. Um, and again, there's just so many unknowns about how this election cycle is going to go in regards to uh, everything from staffing goals, uh, poll worker requirements, um, the, the number of folks, for example, that, that may use the E system. Uh, there's a, a manpower requirement for that as well to address those and keep them secure and to, to go through that process properly. Um, so this is something that, again, as we look at, uh, we suspect in, in future regulatory reviews, we're going to increase somehow the, the transmission. Certainly once we're a top-down system, some of those other reporting requirements will, will become a little more streamlined um, as well and will be more available to the public. So uh, to answer your question directly, as it stands, we're going to attempt to, uh, to, to really provide that information to the public. Certainly it'll be available upon request, uh, but we're going forward, the goal is to make that, that sort of, in, really all information relating, anything that, that the Secretary of State receives uh, will, will be organized, you know, again, with one to 17 counties so that everyone is able to view it uh, in a consistent manner going forward, but um, soon, but not yet. Yeah, it, it, I appreciate you know how hard you've worked on all this and, and the thing is people have lost so much confidence in our elections and i just think this you know we're going to look at it some more later this is a very critical election coming up and and i just feel like these things should have been addressed thank you senator hardy thank you mr chair so does this affect or adversely affect same day Registration. And coincidentally, same day voting. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Mark Lushen, for the record. Uh, adversely, th does this proposed regulation adversely affect same day voting or registration? Uh, no, Senator, I, I do not believe it does. Uh, nor did we hear or receive feedback relating specifically to that. Thank you. And Mr. Velasco, I just wanted to maybe clarify something you said initially when you were uh, answering the question from Assemblywoman Dickman. If I heard you correctly, I think the, the objective would be at some point to have the real-time reporting from the counties, but it sounded like um, from the Secretary of State's uh, position, obviously as the, the entity responsible for conducting elections in conjunction with our 17 county clerks that you felt like imposing that real-time daily reporting requirement might not be feasible. Um, I'm assuming particularly for some of our um, smaller counties 
uh, given lack of resources and personnel. Did I did I hear that correctly? Uh, yes, Chair. Thank you for for clarifying, and I do apologize for not being more uh, succinct and clear in my my answer. That's exactly right, though. Um, some counties could, but but not all. Uh, and again, the goal isn't to to pick and choose, but to have uniform information available to the public. Um, so you're exactly right with the resource concerns. Okay, thank you. No, I think you did a good job answering it, but it's uh, it's Monday and it's three o'clock, so I just wanted to make sure that I I had it right. All right, additional questions, commission members on this particular regulation? Assemblywoman Dickman, please. Sorry to go again. I just had a quick one though. In the olden days, when we went to the polling place to vote, didn't this information used to get posted on the wall as people voted? Uh, or are yes, you too young to remember that? <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, so some information is still required to be posted, uh, and, and this, again, really just provides clarity. There, there are still a number of requirements for the, the clerks and registrars to post certain uh, information uh, in, in those vote centers. Um, yes, ma'am, this, this merely adds to and kind of clarifies some of that in relation to it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, additional questions for Mr. Velasha, who's been on the hot seat for quite a while. A little bit more to go. Uh, okay, I don't see additional questions, so we'd look for a motion to approve. Senator Spearman had her hand up. We'll give her the motion. We'll give Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno the second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see discussion, so all those in favor of approving the regulation, please raise your hand. All right, and then all those opposed, please raise your hand. And so the record is clear. We have no votes from Assemblywoman Dickman and Assemblywoman Krasner, I think that is it. So 10 to two is the vote. The motion carries regulation 097-21 is approved. Moving right along, we'll take up R098-21 Secretary of State regulation revising provisions relating to observation. Who would like to ask a question on this regulation? We'll start with Assemblyman Roberts. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, Sorry. <clears throat> I, uh, so on this one, I, I just wanted some clarification. Uh, under, under the current rules, uh, clerks have the ability to, or the discretion to uh, remove people from the polling place. This basically just gives some specific uh, instances as long as it's uh, involving public safety or confidentiality, correct? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblyman. Yeah, yes, that is correct. Uh, again, increased clarity on what means full observation is. And, and then, so they would, so they would have to. They couldn't just arbitrarily reduce the number of observers. There, there's got to be something that triggers it, and uh, reach one of these instances, and it has to be within the scope of this language. Yes, sir. That is, that is correct. Okay. And then, if we don't pass it, what 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 can they do now? How does this hinder them? It. it Frankly, we just uh, again go back to uh, the status quo uh, again, which is slightly less clear for the public on what exactly those requirements are. Um, but but ultimately, again, would, would still default to the clerks and registrar's ability to uh, uh, you know, maintain uh, good order and discipline. Frankly, at their their polling sites. But, but this provides more clarification for what they can do, and not as much discretion by the, the county clerks. That is right. correct. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Assemblyman Roberts. Additional questions on this regulation? Assemblywoman Dickman. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, yeah, I can see where you're trying to move in a direction where there is more direction, but I don't think this went very far in doing that. So here's a question. What's the issue with the public hearing conversations um, between election board officers? Aren't they public servants who are doing a public job? I thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, there, frankly, is nothing wrong with it. Uh, this this regulation uh, simply doesn't mandate uh, that, that an individual is allowed to to hear uh, every conversation. Um, if they do, and can they? Certainly, that there will be opportunities and certainly discussions that they'll be able to be privy to. Uh, but but this simply it doesn't go as far as having enabling a member of the public to say, I want to be able to hear every conversation in this room. I need to be able to go over uh, and stand next to their clerk or registrar and follow them around throughout the course of the day. Will they hear things? Certainly, absolutely, no question about it. 
uh, but, but it just simply doesn't carve out and mandate that they have the ability to request to hear every single conversation throughout the, the economy of an election. Yeah, I must have read that a little less clearly because I thought that was one of the exclusions. One of the reasons that they could remove people is if they were going to hear these conversations. No, ma'am. Uh, looking on page three of the regulation uh, at, at the bottom, again, it, it defines a little bit more clearly what meaningful observation is. Uh, and it just simply states that the term does not include allowing a person to uh, listen to any conversation between election official, uh, election board officers between a voter and election board officer. Um, so it, again, can they? Uh, absolutely. But it doesn't mandate uh, or require that that is, a, is an option, if that makes sense. Thank you and thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Additional questions on this regulation from commission members? All right, I don't see any hands going up. I would look for a motion to approve. Assemblyman mm -hmm. Howdy has a hand up. I see, I'll give Assemblyman Roberts the second on that one. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And all those opposed, please raise your hand. So we have opposition, uh, no votes from Assemblywoman Dickman and Assemblywoman Krasner. We swapped, swapped squares on my screen. I don't know why that happens sometimes, but uh, the vote is 10 to two to approve the regulation. And therefore uh, regulation 098-21 has been approved. It'll take us to the next regulation for consideration. That's R102-21, again, from the Secretary of State, a regulation revising provisions relating to written challenges. I think this was one that Assemblywoman Krasner asked to be pulled. So we'll go to you for any questions. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Um, I did have a question here and I don't know if it's appropriate for legal or, or who might wanna answer it. But uh, as I look at this, this is, adding additional criteria. It's adding an additional hurdle uh, to challenge the right of a person who may, uh, who is thought to have voted fraudulently. Um, so previously, well, I mean, two, two things here. So previously uh, it was just if, if somebody who's a citizen thought that somebody else was not a citizen and voted improperly, um, they had to have their the person's name, telephone number, uh, but here now it's asking and uh, not just personal knowledge of the facts, uh, not just a sworn affidavit, but and they also must have uh, documentation of evidence supporting the fact upon which each ground for the challenge is based. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, I'm wondering why we want an additional hurdle to somebody reporting someone that they think um, is a non-citizen or should not be voting. Voting, that's number one. And then number two, again, repeatedly, I see uh, a person voting, a person who's being challenged. It should be a citizen. I, I've just heard from hundreds of people, only citizens uh, have the right to vote. So those are my two concerns. The, the, the question is, is this in fact adding another hurdle uh, for a person to, uh, to, uh, to, to basically um, inform that there's a person that they think should not be voting, uh, who is voting? Is this adding another hurdle with that word and? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, so to start with, uh, your, your comment in regards to the person versus citizens, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, but we'll reiterate for the record, again, that is something that we're taking into consideration going forward holistically, though, uh, not just uh, viewing it piecemeal and, and these specific regulations, but but really considering um, you know where which which situations where person versus citizen uh, that does make sense and, and is legally um, clear. Um, so that will be coming uh, potentially you know, as part of a future regulatory review. In re regards to your question about adding an additional hurdle, uh, again, really this this part of the the proposed regulation, specifically clarifying that we we request documentation or evidence supporting the facts, uh, really is to, is to help uh, 
a couple of different situations. Um, this will help enable the, the clerks and registrars uh, in the their review of this process, the, the county and, and city district attorneys that will be involved in these processes as well, to understand the nature of the complaint in, in a way that perhaps in years past maybe wasn't quite possible. Uh, so really, again, this is just to ensure that we are not, you know, again, questioning or disenfranchising any voter um, when, when really, again, uh, if, if the challenge needs to go through and it, it, it's valid and we have the evidence, we're able to identify who exactly we're, uh, the, this challenge is in relation to. Again, there's the statutory and regulatory process that will, will be executed. Um, but, but the additional documentation and evidence is really just to make sure that we have, a uh, again, the election officials across the states better understand uh, you know, the, the nature of this accusation. Thank you for that. And I see Mr. Killian is on, but, but what I do see is um, I believe that currently, if you think someone who's a non-citizen is voting, uh, you just have to give a, a, a sworn affidavit. You have your personal knowledge and facts, uh, your grounds for the challenge as written there. Uh, but now we're adding and, so we're making an additional criteria, an additional hurdle to report someone because now somebody's going to have to give documentation and supporting evidence uh, to prove their ground for the challenge of this uh, person. Again, it should say citizen. So, Mr. Killian, is that your reading on this, please? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, Asher Killian, Chief Deputy of Legislative Council. Um, so, um, to address both of the questions first, um, in the context of this section, I believe person rather than citizen would be the appropriate term because it's a person whose ability to vote is being changed. So the person may or may not be a citizen. We don't necessarily know this capture this challenge. So um, person rather than citizen is probably appropriate here because we're wanting to capture anyone um, who may have cast a vote to be able to challenge whether or not they have the right to vote, including whether or not they're a citizen. Um, for the uh, first question, though, the the and looks new because the um, section was restructured. It used to be um, paragraphs, and now it's subparagraphs. In both cases, this was an uh, a, an inclusive list. Each of the things um, have to be contained in the challenge. So the and isn't new. It just appears because of the way that this was renumbered. But to address the particular question about whether this requires an additional thing to be submitted that wasn't required to be submitted before, the construction of the new subparagraph referring to any documentation or evidence supporting the facts um, doesn't require that there be documentation or evidence. It's just if there is any, um, it is intended to be included in this challenge, whereas before there was no um, provision that allowed for that documentation or evidence to be submitted with the challenge. So. Um, our reading of this would be that it isn't imposing a new requirement that you cannot submit a challenge unless it has documentation or evidence, but rather that if you have any, um, it can be included with the challenge, whereas before there was no mechanism to include that with the challenge. Thank you. Um, but then shouldn't it read and or? I know that's just a legal, um, just a little tiny legal thing, but I, I believe it should read and or and not just and, because and would be also, which would be another hurdle, another requirement for somebody to report somebody who they feel perhaps is a non-citizen and they're voting. So I, I, I don't know if we can fix that or? Uh, Mr. Chair, Asher Killian, Chief Deputy of Legislative Council. Um, so and or is not a construction that we use within NRS or NAC. Um, in this case, the and followed by any is effectively what's doing that same lift. The any um, means that this provision only applies if that thing exists. If there is not um, documenta documentation or evidence, then there wouldn't be any documentation or evidence to submit. I understand that, but I'm looking at the regulation as written and it has the seven requirements uh, that are currently on the books and it says the word and, and then it has the new language documentation or evidence supporting the facts upon which each ground for the challenge is based. And in the law, when you put the word and, it means you have to have both, those seven and the eight. It doesn't say or. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I just I'll say I think this is the reason we're having this discussion. This is the legislative intent and history of this regulation. And I think it's um, at least to me, it's pretty clear that um, it doesn't mean there has to be evidence. It's just that if you have any, then you must submit it, which I think we would want. Right. Because our elections officials should want all the evidence. What we don't want is people coming forward saying, I know this person shouldn't have voted, should not have voted. And I have this document and I'm not going to give it to you. It proves what I said. So, you know, I, I I get I understand where you're coming from, Assemblywoman Krasner, but I think the record we've made today is pretty clear that it's not a requirement that evidence or other uh, documentation be submitted. It's just that if you have it, you should submit it because that'll help the elections officials be able to actually adjudicate any of these claims. So, I mean, with that being said, I feel comfortable and I'm not going to ask legal to do something that we've never done in any other uh, regulatory framework, because I think that that opens up to all hold a whole new set of challenges that uh, I don't really want to open legal up to. Okay, so it's not imposing an additional requirement. That's correct, Mr. Killian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. That's correct. I think as, as the chair represented it, the intent here is that if the evidence exists, it, it can be submitted with the requirement, but this doesn't create a ground to reject a challenge if the challenge does not contain um, such additional documentation or evidence. Thank you. Okay, it looks like I'm still unmuted. So additional questions on 102-21. I see no questions. I would take a motion to approve. I have a lot of hands there. We'll give that one to Senator Spearman and we'll give the second to Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And anyone opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, I think I saw 12 in favor. So uh, that does carry, motion carries unanimously. R102-21 is approved. That takes us next to R104-21, Secretary of State, a regulation revising provisions relating to vital statistics records. And I believe Assemblywoman Krasner pulled this one as well. So we will go to you for the first question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so on R104-21P, this, uh, this refers to dead people voting. Um, so uh, deceased voters is a concern, obviously. We don't want any dead people voting. Um, is there an effective date on this legislation? I, did, I, I pulled it, I did not see an effective date. So would this be effective for our, um, our, our, uh, our primary in June and our general election coming up in November? Or what is the effective date for this legislation, please? It looks like Mr. Killian's on, back on screen, so we'll go uh, we'll go to legal for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Asher Killian, Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. So generally for regulations, unless they contain an effective date stating some other date, they become effective um, immediately after being approved by the Legislative Commission and filed with the Secretary of State. Um, so if the Legislative Commission approves this regulation today, it would presumably be filed with the Secretary of State today, as long as um, the meeting concludes before five o'clock. If not, it would be probably be filed tomorrow. Um, but in either case, it would be effective before the primary and general elections this year. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we, even if it's after five o'clock, Mr. Balashan might be, be there and able to file, uh, even though it's after hours. So as long as we, we get it approved today, I think we'll be all right. Any additional questions? Assemblywoman Dickman? I would just like to move to approve R10421. Perfect. Um, I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Assemblywoman Howdy, you raise your hand. We'll give her the second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. I think that's all 12 of us, but let's be sure anyone opposed, please raise your hand at this point. Okay, so that carries unanimously. R104-21 is approved. That takes us next to R106-21, Secretary of State, a regulation establishing provisions relating to signature verification training. Who would like to ask the first question? Senator Settlemeyer, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The concern I had within R10621 dealt with the fact that it doesn't seem to bring in the discussion 
of regulations and rules to create some uniformity within the electronic signature verification that is done by machines. It seems that this is solely dealing with those counties that have signature verification by manual, which in the last election, we saw a situation where the average Senate seat that was located in the rules was running about four to 500 signatures that had to be cured. And I'm okay with that. And my daughter was one of those signatures that had to be cured because when she was 18, she signed up to vote and surprise, surprise, two years later, after actually having to sign her name on checkbooks and you know different forms for school, she actually developed a signature because sadly, we're not exactly teaching penmanship the way we once did. Not that my penmanship's that great, I'll have to admit. But in that respect, it seems that this regulation does nothing to deal with the consistency of the machine. And like I said, in the rules, it was about 500 a senatorial district where down in Clark County, that machine was only rejecting about 20 to 29 in a Senate district. And I find that troubling. So I was curious, does this apply at all to the machine? Or is this only dealing with human uh, verification? Thank you, Senator, for the question, Mark Velashin, for the record. Uh, th this does just specifically relate to the signature verification training that was, re was required uh, as a provision of Assembly Bill 321. Uh, again, to further clarify what that requirement is uh, and some of the, the, the various uh, aspects relating uh, to it. I appreciate it, Mr. Velashin. I think it's uh, an error. It was kind of my intent when that bill was going through that signature verification meant for everything, not just uh, human being verification, but to worry about what a computer is dialed down or up to. Uh, thank you. Assemblywoman Woman Dickman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for being so indulgent. Um, my question just has to do with the specifics of the training. Why is there no definition of what a passing grade might be? I mean, just because you take the training, how do you show your proficiency in that you are actually qualified? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, the, the definition of a passing grade uh, is not contained within this provision in part because it hasn't quite yet been discussed or, or, or solidified. Um, it, we've, we've conducted a significant amount of effort in, in, or put a significant amount of effort in, in research into identifying uh, appropriate signature verification training and processes. Um, but as, it, as we're, we're getting closer now to, to finalizing that training, and I believe in the next week or two, we, we should have something uh, in, in a final uh, state that we can provide to the clerks and registrars. Um, again, as we drafted this regulation and started getting it through the timeline, it, it had not been clarified. Going forward, again, that, that is certainly something that as we look to continuing to improve our signature verification training, you know, even, even as we have this first iteration uh, that we're ready to getting ready to, to, to release uh, in preparation for the primary election uh, and, and looking to future election cycles, we certainly anticipate uh, again, scrutinizing what we're doing, what works, what doesn't, how we can make it better uh, and provide more clarity, not only to the public, but also to the clerks and registrars and so that they can, can pass that information on to their uh, election workers and other administrative staff that, that affect the, uh, the election. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome. We'll go next to Senator Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So how, how do we rationalize the difference in uh, the numbers of electronic signature verification. Are we using 20 point verification in one county and 40 in another? What, what are we doing with the electronic signatures? Because it seems it's pretty obvious that, you know, if it's not like the rurals are the only ones that change their signature, what is it that that happened? Thank you for the question, Senator Mark Velashin, for the record. Um, currently, only one county is using electronic signature verification. Um, again, looking to the future, this is something that, that we've been discussing, again, with clerks and registrars across the state. Um, depending on, on how many folks uh, use the mail ballot uh, going into the 22 cycle, and then, again, even as we get closer to the 2024 cycle, um, including the presidential preference primary, of course, in February of 24, uh, we're going to keep a close eye on the number of mail ballots used um, and are going to ensure that one way or the other, if, if other counties are interested in pursuing electronic signature verification, that it is standardized in regards to what that, that process is. Um, so that, again, uniform uh, uh, requirements and standards across the state uh, are, are met and upheld. Um, as, as only one county currently is using uh, electronic signature verification, 
Um, again, we're, we're still working through that process. It is a very new thing, as you remember. Uh, the machine itself it was leased during the primary and, and only purchased during the general election of 2020. Um, so it, it's something that we're continuing to look closely at and we'll, we'll certainly continue to refine regulations for going into the future. So what you're saying is the electronic, even as flawed as it may be, was uh, 10, 20, 30 times better than the rural signature verification uh, by hand. Is that the concept? Is that is that borne out that the electronic verification is by a 20 into 500, you know, it 10, 20 times better than the hand verification? Senator, thank you for the question, Mark Velashin, for the record. Um, I, I don't have the specific stats or, or ability to compare cross county uh, exactly the effective rates, so to speak, of, of those signature verifications. Um, I, I do know that the machine uh, that was used in Clark County uh, was adjusted so that if there was any possible doubt, uh, it did spit that, that ballot envelope out so that humans had to review it. Um, in the signature verification training that this regulation describes, again, we'll, we'll really just standardize the training and the expectations for uh, election administrators um, and their staffs across the state. Uh, but in regards to was the machine more effective than, than a person or not, um, again, our, our goal, I simply can't speak to that. Our goal is instead to just make sure that we're being consistent across the state uh, and continuing to provide a high level of security uh, for this part of the process. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Do I have additional questions from committee members on this regulation? Assemblyman Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, so just to clarify, uh, so people that do signature ver verification, this regulation would require specific training and each county has to have people that do s manual signature verification. So a clerk just couldn't say, well, I'm not sending anybody to the training, they're required to have it. Is that correct? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblyman. Yes, yes, sir, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Further questions from the committee? Not seeing further questions, we'll take a motion to approve. Senator Spearman has a hand up. I'll go ahead and give her the motion. I'll give uh, Assemblywoman Howdy the second on that motion. Any dis any discussion before we take the vote? Chairman? Senator Senator Senator, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, the concept that we're not including inside this regulation, the electronic signature verification that was done in the largest county in the state of Nevada, I find very troubling. Because again, there's nothing wrong with actually curing signatures, making sure that people are actually who they are when they vote. Uh, that doesn't bother me at all. For that reason, I oppose this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any further discussion? Okay, I don't see any other hands up. So at this time, we'll go ahead and take the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And then any opposed, uh, please raise your hand at this point. So we have opposition from Senator Settlemeyer, Assemblyman Roberts, Senator Hardy, Assemblywoman Krasner, Assemblywoman Dickman, and Senator Hammond, did you have your hand up too? Okay, so if my math is correct, I think that's a six, six, that would mean uh, it's a split vote and the regulation fails. So we will not be mandating training for those who are reviewing electronic signatures, at least not in a consistent way throughout the state. So uh, that regulation uh, again fails. And I think committee, correct, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we got through all of them, right? Do we have anything else we have to do? Okay, I see some thumbs up. I know there were a lot of them. So uh, Mr. Velashin, I wanna thank you for being here with us today. We asked you a lot of questions and uh, took a few hours of your time. So thank you for your work on these regulations. Thank you for being here to answer any questions. We certainly appreciate it. My pleasure, thank you for your time. All right, committee, take a deep breath. We got a few more things to do yet on the agenda. And next up, I should say that completes agenda item number six. Next up, we have uh, agenda item number seven, and we can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we have a number of appointments to be made through agenda item number seven. Um, in your packet, you should have listed um, the recommended appointees. We could either 
uh, take a motion on all of the items in number seven together, or if anyone would like, we could go through each one individually and take separate motions. So I guess, let me ask it this way. Is there anyone who would like to go through and take um, 10 separate motions on these items or would, uh, is there anyone that would like to do that in, rather than do one motion? I think we should discuss each one too, as well. I'm kidding. <laughs> Move to approve in mass. Okay, so we we have to do one agenda item at a time. So we can approve everything under agenda item seven, which is A through J. I think we have a motion from Assembly, or excuse me, Senator Hardy to, to, to do that. And we have a hand up, I think, from a couple others. We'll give it to Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion to appoint those who are listed? Okay, I don't see discussion. So let's go ahead and take a vote on that. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Thank you. And anyone opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, so 12 nothing. That motion carries unanimously and that takes care of the, the appointments in agenda item number seven, A through J. That takes us next to agenda item number eight, which I think is just one item, so give me a second to find, find my notes here. So this is the nomination of a legislator for appointment by the governor to the Nevada Early Intervention Interagency Coordinating Council, Public Law 99-457, Part C. In the meeting materials, we have a recommendation that Assemblywoman Teresa Brown May, it should be Trace, excuse me, Tracy Brown May, be uh, nominated for appointment by the governor to this council. Do I have a motion to do so? Mm -hmm. Motion from Senator Dennis. I had a hand raised from Senator Hardy, so we'll go ahead and give him the second. Um, any discussion on the motion? I don't see discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, motion carries unanimously on agenda item number eight. That takes us to agenda item number nine. And again, committee, we can do these three all at the same time if you would like there are three committees listed there the advisory council on mortgage investments and mortgage lending the commission on ethics and the sunset subcommittee of the legislative commission uh, so again i'll give folks the opportunity if there's any discussion on the individual agenda items we could pull them out otherwise i would take a motion to make the appointments under agenda item number nine so moved so we have a motion from assemblywoman dickman we'll give senator hardy the second any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And anyone opposed, please raise your hand. That is a 12 nothing vote. That means those appointments are approved under agenda item number nine. That takes us to agenda item. By the way, thank you. <laughs> thank you commission for uh, making that go quickly. I appreciate that. Agenda item number 10 is next. This is a correction of an error in Senate Bill 186 of the 2021 legislative session. Brian Fernley, our legal counsel, is here to present this item. I see Mr. Fernley is on the screen with his camera on. So Mr. Fernley, please go ahead and uh, make your presentation on agenda item 10. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you mentioned, um, during the 2021 legislative session, um, the uh, legislature enacted Senate Bill 186, um, which revised uh, various provisions governing homeowners associations and specifically the manner in which um, uh, homeowners associations disseminate um, information and, and communicate with homeowners in the, in the HOA. Uh, when, when the final amendment to the bill was being processed um, by the legal division, an error occurred that resulted in HOAs um, being required to send all information to homeowners by both electronic mail and regular mail, rather than by electronic mail or regular mail. This effectively resulted in a duplicative requirement that all information and communications from an HOA to homeowners be distributed by both email and regular mail, um, when the intent was, was not to make such a duplicative requirement, but to have um, one or the other um, be provided to the, to the homeowners in the HOA. Uh, to correct the error, um, the AND um, that would require information to be sent by both email and regular mail would be changed to an OR so that the information could be sent by either email or regular mail. 
Um, there are exceptions that existed in this statute um, prior to SB 186 and that continue to be in place after SB 186 um, that, that specifically govern um, the collection process and foreclosure process in HOAs. And, and so this, this um, bill and this change didn't, won't affect uh, those provisions. Um, NRS 218D.720 um, um, does authorize the Legislative Commission to correct errors in legislation after the adjournment of the legislative session. And um, that does require a unanimous vote of the Legislative Commission. Um, this um, error in SB 186, again, to, to change from um, having all information and communications from an HOA being sent by both email and regular mail to sending them by either email or regular mail, um, that is the type of error that the Legislative Commission can correct um, uh, with a unanimous vote. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Fernley. appreciate that explanation. Do we have questions from commission members on this agenda item? Uh, Senator Dennis, please. Just a quick question. Um, I because I, I don't remember the, the intent of the legislation was to do does it give that uh, ability to the HOA to determine whether they're going to send one or the other? No, it, it gives the ability to the homeowner to elect um, to receive their communications by email. Um, and uh, well, I guess with respect to certain notices, it would be up to the homeowner to elect um, to receive them by email. Um, the other, uh, just the general information and communications, it would be up to the HOA to, to choose um, the preferred method. Um, but if there was not an email address provided or a homeowner opted out of email, then regular mail would be required. I, I just wanted to be, I, I want to make sure it wasn't up to the HOA to determine, you know, to do one or the other and they make, cause they may have some, and I couldn't remember from the law, the, from the legislation, if it was uh, how that was. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions from commission members? Mr. Chair? Senator Spearman, please. Uh, yeah, I don't actually have a question. Just uh, want to add um, the point of clarification. The, the intent of the bill was really to lessen the cost uh, for administration for HOAs. Uh, when people receive things email, it, you don't have to put the stamps, the envelopes, and et cetera, et cetera. And <clears throat> in this day and age, there are a number of people who would much rather have it email than um, have it snail mail to them. Uh, email, email will follow the, uh, the homeowner wherever they are, uh, whether or not they're in town to go to the mailbox to pick the mail out of it and take it to the house and open it up. The email is, is always there. So the, in the original intent of the bill uh, was really to lessen the uh, financial burden that some, especially smaller uh, HOAs, um, might be um, uh, under. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that clarification, and uh, I think you're correct in that it, it the email follows the the uh, homeowner, and then it's easier to archive those things. I think by email too, because we all have paper, and we can never seem to find that paper uh, when you need it. So. Um, I appreciate, uh, I know you were a sponsor of the bill, so I appreciate your intent in, in doing that. And um, all right, so let me ask, are there other questions from commission members? And again, a reminder that this uh, has to be unanimous vote of the commission to make this correction. So seeing no further questions, I would look for a motion to correct Senate Bill 186. Let's see, Senator Hardy has a hand up. I'll give him the motion. I'll go ahead and give Senator Spearman the second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I don't see discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, I need 12 here. Do we have 12? We have 12. All right, the motion carries. Um, and so therefore that will be corrected. Um, thank you, Legal, for bringing that to our attention. And thank you, Legislative Commission, for your vote on that. All right, we are almost at the finish line. That takes us to our second to last agenda item. Uh, we're gonna go to agenda item number 11. This is approval of the use of LCB resources to explore the feasibility of a legislative multi-use building in Clark County. Our LCB director, Ms. Erdos, will present this item and then we'll have questions. So please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is intended to seek the approval of the Legislative Commission 
to use our existing LCB resources to explore the feasibility of acquiring a legislative multi-use um, building in, in Clark County. The idea is for the LCB staff to research the availability of existing buildings that we could lease or buy or land on which a new building could be built, as well as talking with uh, legislators and others to determine the needs of the of the legislators and others have for such a building. Um, I think uh, most of you probably know that the Grant Sorry building will be uh, closed in, in 2023 at some point um, for construction and, and we would be out for two to three years. And so the idea here is to explore whether uh, the legislature wants to continue to be um, a part of, use a part of the Grant Sawyer building or have a separate building um, for legislative use in, in Clark County. Um, we're not seeking any new money uh, to be approved for this project at this time. Our intent would be to use existing employee time and other existing resources um, for this project. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Dos. Do I have questions on this agenda item? I don't see any hands up for questions. So at this time, I would look for a motion to approve agenda item number 11. Okay, we have, we have a whole bunch of hands up, so I don't know. I'll give this one to Assemblywoman Krasner. We'll give the second to Assemblyman Roberts. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And if we have any opposed, would you please raise your hand? It looks like a 12-0 vote. So agenda item 11 is approved. And we look forward to hearing an update on progress on this item. I routinely get requests from constituents here about uh, the Grant Sawyer building and where they might be able to go to participate or meet with legislators. So I think that's a, it's a very pressing issue. Okay, committee. So, um, we are now going to go to our second period of public comment, which is agenda item number 12. If there's anyone who has stuck around through this meeting and wishes to give uh, wishes to provide public comment, please call the number that is indicated on the agenda and you'll be informed by the BPS services when you have been connected and it is your turn to speak. Uh, like the first round of public comment, comments will be limited to two minutes per person. I will be timing and I'll let you know when your two minutes are up. I don't think I had to do that at all at the beginning of the meeting. So um, everyone did a great job. And then if you wanna submit additional comments, uh, you can do so in writing. They, they will be included in the record. So I'm now gonna turn this over to BPS to see if there's anybody else, anybody on the line who'd like to give public comment before we adjourn this afternoon. BPS, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Yeager. To provide public comment, Please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Once again, to provide public comment, please press star nine on your telephone to take your place in the queue. Chair Yeager, the public line is open and working. However, there are no participants wishing to give public comment at this time. Well, color me surprised that we don't have any public comment on the second round. That might be a first. Um, but I want to thank BPS for, for having the line open and ready. So I, I'll close um, agenda item number 12. And then before we adjourn today, Senator Settlemeyer, I wanted to go to you. I think you had a comment that you wanted to make or a question. I appreciate it. I was wondering if maybe we could find a way to uh, find a time for members of Let's Come to actually make, you know, questions or statements on, you know, the record. Specifically, it's been a while since we've had a litigation update, and I was kind of looking forward to that. So maybe we could add that to next agenda. I'd also love, and I know this is going to be a shock to everyone, the ability to come back in and actually be in a committee room. Uh, I know sometimes that's, some people consider that to be boring. I think it's important, and I'm here at the legislative building and would love to be in an actual committee room and once again, go down that road. I, I do realize that that adds a little bit of cost and resources to this process, but I think it's important for the public to be able to come in and participate. I, I think this new process of Zoom is fantastic. We've added opportunities for people to not have to have as much travel, but I think it'd be great if we could somehow incorporate both of them. And also a question of how the litigation is being funded for 
outside counsel and stuff like that. So I'm just throwing that out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. I anticipate we'll have a, a litigation update, uh, hopefully on our next agenda. And um, like you, I hope we'll be together in a committee room soon. Although there is not a touch up my appearance feature when we're live and in person as there is on Zoom. So like me, you know, I think I look better on Zoom, but we'll deal with that as it comes. Anything else from committee members before we wrap up today's meeting? Okay, I don't see anything else. I just wanted to thank you all. It was a long afternoon. Um, I want to thank the staff for all the hard work that they did in getting us ready for today. And again, thank the members for all the work you did before we got here to today's meeting. I think it really shows. So as always, uh, most appreciative of your public service. And I hope you all have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. And I'm sure we will see you soon. So with that, this meeting is adjourned.